Defense Department rubble. Estimates of the death toll there range from 100 to as many as 800. But the core of the story right now is still the search for the dead and injured in New York. And here tracking that is Ed Bradley. Ed? Dan, as you mentioned, Mayor Giuliani has said that uh, 41 people are known dead. That number is certain to rise. The 259 uniformed officers that you mentioned uh, that are uh, still unaccounted for includes 202 firefighters. This is the, the worst disaster in the history of the city of New York. But there is some hope that some may be found alive because overnight uh, three people were pulled out alive from the rubble. Many of the firemen were in the building fighting uh, the fire and trying to help rescue people when it collapsed around them. The policemen were caught on the uh, perimeter and uh, when the building came, there, hope, there is hope that some of them may still be alive. We're told that they are in uh, cell phone contact with at least one person under the rubble, and they're hoping that, uh, that there are more who are still alive. Uh, I met with some people this morning uh, who came in by train from Summit, New Jersey, small town over in New Jersey, but many people uh, there work in the World Trade Center. And there were about 46 people here this morning uh, who have not been able to find their relatives. Uh, their names are not on any of the lists. They're going around to the hospitals, and so far, they haven't found any. We've talked to an insurance company that had offices at the World Trade Center. They are unable to account for about a 1,000 of their people. The mayor has said, as best he can tell, there may be a few thousand people in each of those buildings. Uh, but there is some concern that the death toll here in New York alone uh, may rise to over 10,000 people. Uh, 266 people, as you know, were killed on those four airplanes. And as you said, down in Washington, it's estimated that the death toll is somewhere at the Pentagon between 100 and uh, 800 people. Uh, they are unable to uh, undertake a full-scale uh, search and rescue in the Pentagon because the fires are still burning. As you know, that plane uh, that crashed there, as the others were, were fully loaded for a flight to the West Coast, and there are still pools of that very flammable and explosive jet fuel uh, in places of the Pentagon that are difficult to reach, and with the slate roof, that's also still burning, so they, uh, they, can't, get, uh, they can't get to those people. Uh, one point I might make from overseas, Dan, is that, uh, and this is important because it would indicate a level of political support that uh, the president is looking for from our European allies, that the NATO nations are considering a resolution uh, that would enable them to uh, adopt the mutual defense clause. And that resolution would say that this attack against the United States is an attack against all members of NATO. And that would certainly give the president the kind of political support from our European allies that he's looking for. Ed Bradley, thanks. On the phone is 60 Minutes 2 correspondent Scott Pelley, who is very close to the center of devastation at the site of what was the World Trade Center Twin Towers. Scott? Dan, I'm, I'm right at the base of what remains of one of the World Trade Center Towers. The, the jagged metal fingers of the remains are, are jutting up above me about maybe five stories or so from the 110-story building. We've been down here for a couple of hours with physicians, firemen, police officers who are, are digging in the rubble. They're using heavy cranes and front loaders to lift the, the debris. But at least in this particular corner where I'm standing now, there have been no signs of life. There was about an hour ago uh, the thought that somebody might have been found alive. The physicians I was with were alerted. They went in, but apparently that was a false alarm. Standing at the base of the World Trade Center Tower, you are struck by the lack of building debris in the street. That is to say, there's a great deal of paper and, and, and construction material, if you will, in the street, but, but not the heavy structure of the building. One of the rescue workers we were talking to says that the theory now is that the building collapsed internally like a chute and there are several stories of basement under the World Trade Center Tower. And the fear is that anyone who remained in those buildings went down this chute, if you will, and are now trapped in the basement under 110 stories of debris. One fireman I spoke with said, this, this isn't a rescue effort now, it's a cleanup effort. Dan? Scott Pelley in lower Manhattan. Breaking news in Washington, we go to David Martin at the Pentagon. David?
Dan, I have to uh, speak rather quickly here because we've just had a bomb threat here and they're about to evacuate the uh, Pentagon. A few hours ago, I spoke briefly with Defense Secretary Rumsfeld as he was leaving the building for a meeting at the White House. And I asked him about this estimate that as many as 850 people could be dead here. And he said that based on the uh, people still unaccounted for, 850 seems way too high. I have every confidence that that number is, is going to prove to be uh, substantially higher than anything that will eventuate. The number's going to be uh, considerably lower than that, I believe. Good Lord willing. The search for the bodies has not really begun because the area where the plane hit is still being treated as a crime scene by the FBI, and it is still too unstable. Also, the fire started by the plane's jet fuel continues to burn. We have had the fuel from the jet catch fire again. Outside, the wife of an Army accountant who worked right where the plane hit can only wait and hope against hope. Obviously, the fire is still pretty much going, but it's still frustrating to see them just kind of looking at it and not going in. As for the military situation, all bases remain on the highest state of alert, although that could be eased later in the day. Fighter jets continue to patrol both the east and west coast, looking for signs of any incoming aircraft. Um, and Navy warships have been sent to both Washington and New York. Now, the aircraft carrier Enterprise, which had just left the Persian Gulf and headed for home, has been told to stay there, and that gives the U.S. two carrier battle groups in and around the Persian Gulf, uh, obviously being kept there in preparation for uh, whatever retaliatory action is uh, taken against the terrorists. Uh, now, as to the question for uh, uh, who did it, Osama bin Laden remains the uh, prime uh, and perhaps only suspect. And as uh, one senior U.S. official who has been briefed on the latest intelligence uh, put it to me, the noose is tightening. Dan? David Martin, Dateline Washington, the Federal Aviation Administration has decided to continue its ban on flying today. The FAA says it isn't sure when airline flights will resume. Now, this is somewhat different than we told you at the top of the hour. Things have changed. At there was a plan to lift at least part of the ban at noon Eastern time. The FAA says they're just not prepared, and they and the airlines are not prepared to do that. A spokeswoman for the FAA says that agency officials are deciding when to allow planes to take off. Uh, Hartsfield Atlanta National Airport, of course, a major airline hub, said it would not open uh, today uh, at noon, and uh, frankly, they weren't certain when they would open. Delta Airlines said that all of its flights would be canceled until at least 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time today. That would include commuter flights. Another FAA spokesman said people should not expect all flights to resume normal travel since many planes are at the wrong airport. So the FAA flying ban uh, remains in effect. We simply do not know when airlines will begin flying again. Let's go to Bob Orr in Washington. Bob? Not sure uh, what to do. Uh, Dan, to repeat, the authorities at the Department of Transportation in the White House really aren't sure how to approach this. Uh, we're in uncharted water, so to speak. We've never had a nationwide ground stop, that is to say, a ban of all flights. And what they said yesterday was they'd take a look at the system this morning and maybe they could get it back up and running at noon. Here's the problem. There seem to be conflicting agendas here. On the one hand, there is a great desire to get the system back to some uh, semblance of normalcy. That would send the signal that the U.S. has not been cowed, that the system has not been severely uh, damaged by the attacks. But at the same time, they can't do that just to make a point. The symbolism isn't worth it if they don't have the security all in line. Now, I've been told by people who've been sitting in some of the meetings, that when the airplanes are allowed to return to the air, and that could be later today, frankly, it could be tomorrow or even after that, but when that happens, we will see a level of security in this country that we have not seen before with aviation. Uh, there will be no curbside check-in. We saw that during the Gulf War, but I'm told you won't be able to drop off passengers at curbs. Uh, there will be much more intense scrutiny at the X-ray and magnetometer uh, areas. They're talking even about, for the first time, matching every bag to every passenger. And now I see uh, reports that some airports, including Boston's Logan, 
are going as far as to ban all knives. In the past, you could carry some small knives on airplanes. So this is a balancing act. Try to make sure the security is in place. Don't take any unnecessary risks. But at the same time, you can't stay down so long that it looks like you've been crippled. This is what the authorities are wrestling with at this hour. And I don't think it's going to sort itself out anytime soon. Even when they do give the green light to go ahead, I think it's safe to say that gridlock will be the rule probably for days. Dan? Bob Orr in Washington. Sandra Hughes is at Los Angeles International Airport. Sandra? I'm sorry, it's a little confusing here, but uh, what we'd like to tell you is that uh, CBS News has just been told by one federal official uh, that's been in the planning meeting with the FAA, and this sort of goes along with what you just uh, uh, were announcing a few minutes ago, that the FAA said uh, that the airports would not be reopened today, but, but this one federal official says that airports actually, JFK, Dulles, and Los Angeles International Airport in particular, may not even open as soon as tomorrow. Now, this is just one federal official who was in one of these FAA planning uh, meetings. But, Dan, we're waiting here in Los Angeles to hear from airport officials who plan a noon Pacific time press conference to sort of fill us in on what they're being told by the FAA. What they have been saying to folks here in Southern California is just don't come down to the airport. It's not open. Don't cause gridlock. Don't come down here and try to uh, book a flight because there's really nothing you can do. Earlier today, we had heard from Alaska Airlines that they were hopeful uh, to be back up and running maybe at about 25 percent capacity by noon pacific time but obviously uh, that's going to be impossible we've also heard from seattle's airport that they do not plan to resume any flights today either uh, so we are getting a, a new information uh, moment by moment on uh, what's going on with these airports nationwide dan sandra hughes at los angeles international airport a point of clarification and an important one uh, David Martin reported earlier that the Pentagon is being evacuated again. Um, the first reports were that was because of a bomb threat. Uh, there's now been a clarification from the Defense Department saying that some of the fires uh, that they thought had been tamped down had flared up again inside the building. So as a strictly precautionary measure, they were evacuating uh, the Pentagon once again, or at least large portions of it. Uh, the Federal Reserve has added an unusually large sum some 38 plus billion dollars into temporary reserves to the u.s banking system the federal reserve is pumping money into the financial system uh, to make sure that that system holds steady and uh, doesn't deteriorate in any way let's go to john roberts at the white house john dan uh, president bush at present is in the cabinet room here at the white house meeting with the bipartisan leadership from capitol hill now the reason for this is threefold first of all he wants to update the leaders of Congress on the investigation, the uh, recovery and search and rescue efforts, wants to talk to them about where to go next. Secondly, they are all getting together this morning to send a very strong message to the world that there is no partisanship involved here, that the members of Congress and the administration are speaking as one, getting behind the president. The United States is being forthright in saying we are going to address the situation. We are going to go out and we are going to identify those who are responsible. And third, the president is sending up to Congress today an emergency funding bill in which he is asking Congress for the authority to spend whatever it takes to both help out uh, the District of Columbia in addressing the situation at the Pentagon to help New York City to protect the people of America and provide for America's defense. Now, earlier at about 9.30 this morning, the president convened a meeting of his National Security Council. Following that, we heard from the president for the first time today in language that is much stronger than anything he has said up until now. The deliberate and deadly attacks which were carried out. We are continuing to monitor the national situation. We see there President Bush, who spoke uh, about an hour ago, addressing the uh, media in Washington, D.C. We want to just bring you some local information as the Spirit of Oklahoma Crisis Relief Fund and Blood Drive continues this morning, an overwhelming response to our request for people to stop by at our studios. Rick Wells is out front with more. Rick. Hey, we're out at uh, 3rd and Franklin, and the reason we're laughing is because we've got Ron Brown here from uh, Smith Barney, right? Yes. And uh, it, he got into the investment business so he could handle checks and things that didn't weigh. This, there must be 50 pounds of change Good in this uh, popcorn thing. And uh, A woman just dropped it by and said, here's a check and take this can. Yeah. So people are really giving from the heart, and that's important to yeah, us right now. Yeah. Good. How are your people in New York, Ron? Right? Our people in New York are fine. Uh, most of the financial firms... Uh, are fine. Um, there's a lot of people missing, but I say that uh, everybody's got a positive attitude, and 
the terrorists certainly didn't get our our spirits. So that's the main thing. Well, we're glad you're here, Ron. Thanks Thank you very much. much. I'll let you mm -hmm. take that over there. Kim Graham is wow. here. Kimmy and uh, <clears throat> we have Kim has been talking to people uh, in New York from Tulsa, and we have been uh, collecting money out here on the corner. And it's just it just warms your heart to know that there's so many people that are willing to give. Well, them. you're absolutely right, Rick. And I just want to say that you know I'm I'm always amazed at how tough Oklahomans in particular really are. We always come through, no matter what the disaster, tragedy, or the situation. Not only do we come through for other Oklahomans, but we come through for the country. And I think that has a lot to say about the people here. It really does. And, and the donations, there's no donation that's too small. We really want to emphasize that. If you have a dollar, bring the dollar by mm -hmm. because it all adds up. Yep. This has been wonderful. Yeah, and it goes to the uh, American Red Cross and their relief effort. And they are also uh, a blood drive going on all the rest of today at both locations, 11th and Highway 169 and also out at uh, 77th and South Memorial. We'd invite you to come down and see us. We'll be here uh, through the noon hour and most of the afternoon and the folks at the red cross will be out there until uh, until about six o'clock this mm -hmm. evening or until they're finished and we want to say too that uh, we're handing out ribbons as long as we have them and we're tying ribbons onto the car antennas just as a sign of support yep. for the people in uh, washington the people in new york and just our country okay leanne all right, Rick, we'll remind folks, come by here, our studios, or certainly they'll take cash donations as well at the two other Red Cross locations. We appreciate everyone's support, and we will continue to keep you posted locally on what's happening and, of course, that special interfaith service here at noon, and we'll bring you that live coming up. Now we go back to CBS. Inside St. Vincent's Hospital, visiting with victims and family members, uh, a very, very somber, ashen-looking mayor spoke at this podium behind me uh, before he went in saying that uh, they are still taking debris out of the site. The major effort is to make it more efficient down by the World Trade Buildings to pull people out. And as far as we know from what the mayor is saying, this is still a rescue mission. Um, although, Dan, I think what's concerning a lot of people today is that the casualties are just trickling in. Considering the magnitude of this catastrophe, we may have expected to see more casualties going into day two. We're still just seeing um, actually you know, relatively small numbers considering what happened. Here at St. Vincent's, they're saying there are now 369 patients here. There have been four deaths. A couple of people have been transferred to burn units. Uh, St. Vincent's has seen 68 firefighters and police officers, and the kinds of injuries they're seeing are predominantly respiratory difficulties. The air is thick with dust and smoke down at the site of the disaster, so a lot of people are having trouble breathing. They're seeing a lot of abrasions, and uh, Dan, what they're saying is that a lot of the firefighters and rescue workers are cutting, coming in with cuts and bruises all over their hands because they are actually physically digging for people and survivors with their hands. Now, behind me here at uh, St. Vincent's, there are stretchers and wheelchairs waiting, but again, waiting seems to be the word of the day. We have been waiting for more casualties to come in um, and so far have not seen that many. Uh, I spoke to an Episcopal priest earlier this morning, Dan, who spent the night down at the site. He was there nine hours looking for people and in that nine hour stretch of time, he and his colleagues rescued one person. So I think the concern now is growing that uh, we may not be seeing mass casualties, but in fact a mass grave site. Whatever the situation, the hospitals are prepared. They have now set up a family center here at St. Vincent's. Hospital uh, spokespeople tell me they have now seen about 200 families here. Uh, they're counseling them and helping them, um, whether their families are in the hospital or missing. Dan? Elizabeth Calladin at New York St. Vincent Hospital. For news about the investigation into who did this, who did these terrible deeds, Jim Stewart in Washington is our main man for that. Jim? Dan, the headline from here this, uh, this afternoon is that uh, federal investigators believe they are making progress in determining who conducted these attacks. The investigation appears initially to be focusing on two commercial aviation flight instruction schools, both located in Florida. Apparently, some of the men who were involved in these attacks may have, stress may have, received their training there. These men are believed to have been connected to Ramzi Youssef, a name well known to federal law enforcement people because he is in custody for the first attempt to blow up the World Trade Center in 1993. He had attempted uh, earlier to recruit people who knew how to fly, and apparently the federal government had intercepted messages from him as, as late as then, indicating that this one day would be his plan. 
Search warrants are also being executed elsewhere in Florida. This appears to be based on a review of the flight manifest from the doomed aircraft. In Boston, authorities have recovered luggage that apparently was intended to uh, go on board one of the doomed flights with one of the hijackers included in that was a video, a uh, flight training video showing how to fly this aircraft. Meanwhile, it appears that more people than initially thought may have been involved in the actual hijackings. Members of Congress are now being told by a federal lawman that as many as three to five hijackers may have been on board each of these aircraft, and they believe that there was a, a, a group of people who were providing logistical support on the ground. Apparently, the federal government believes that that group is still at large, and they say it is their primary focus, I quote them directly this morning, in determining who those accomplices were. And finally, Dan, let me add uh, to this uh, latest news we have on the FAA deciding that there will be no more flights in the United States today. The FBI uh, told me this morning that they have interjected themselves into this debate fiercely and they are suggesting that armed federal law enforcement officers be at every airport and possibly even on every flight and clearly that's going to take some time to sort out. I think we may be in for a wait before planes fly again. Dan? Jim Stewart. Ed Bradley, this situation in Florida about this mm -hmm. flight school that recruits people from overseas to come in and be trained, uh, this is a very interesting development in the, the case. Yeah, there are actually two flight schools there, Dan. One is called the Embry-Riddle Flight School, and then there's another one in Venice, Florida, called the Huffman School. And uh, a couple uh, in that area say that, that the FBI told them that two men who stayed with them last summer were involved in this terrorist attack. Uh, so far, there have been no arrests, but uh, four homes have been searched in that area. They also picked up one police car because they saw a picture of Osama bin Laden, an abandoned uh, passenger car, rather, that was prominently displayed on one side. Interesting and a development worth uh, pursuing. Let's check in with Cynthia Bowers at O'Hare Airport in Chicago. With the context of this re report from Cynthia being the FAA, we want to repeat for emphasis, yes, they intended for some flights to start flying at noon Eastern time today. That's not going to happen. The FAA is extending the no-fly policy, if you will, for at least an additional day. Cynthia Bowers. Dan, originally people had been told that they could arrive around 8 o'clock and try to make those flights that began at noon. But when people began arriving, they were turned away by police. They are now being told the airport is closed. We're not seeing a lot of people, just a peppering. I think most people are really uncertain as to whether this noon deadline was going to work and people were going to be able to fly. I think there's a tremendous amount of concern at this particular airport. It is a hub for United and American. Those were the planes that were hijacked yesterday. Last night, our photographer witnessed what looked like a bomb sweep of the United Terminal. There are a lot of employees inside, and we can only presume that maybe they're being schooled in some of those new security measures that Jim Stewart, um, that told, Bob Moore told us about just a few minutes ago. So this is an airport, you remember, that has 200,000 or more people coming through every single day, more than a million on weekends. That is an awful lot of bags to be checked particularly at an airport that is criticized for delays. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on this particular airport, I believe, and they want to be dead sure that nothing goes wrong. Dan? Cynthia Bowers in Chicago at Logan Airport in Boston is CBS News correspondent Wyatt Andrews. Wyatt. Dan, here at Boston Logan, things are as shut down as you can imagine. If, if as anyone can imagine, this is an airport with more than 200 flights every day. Uh, an average of eight to 10,000 passengers, and today state police have, have the area completely cordoned off as officials complete this check, uh, this complete sweep with dogs and, and, uh, and, and chemical sweepers all through the, both the terminal areas of Boston Logan and also the parking lots. Because of this FAA directive not to have vehicles within 300 feet of a terminal, uh, that has put Boston Logan uh, in extreme uh, dis distress, you might say, because there are 2,500 vehicles in the close-in parking lots to this terminal, and that has raised the prospect, if you can imagine this, of tow trucks lining up here to evacuate those vehicles as officials try to complete this sweep. Earlier this afternoon, Massport officials here, the Aviation Authority, briefed reporters on the progress of trying to reopen Boston Logan. Uh, Good morning, everyone. I'm Leanne Taylor. We're still monitoring national coverage, but we want to take a quick opportunity to update you on the local angle of the attack on America. 
As you know, the FAA has grounded commercial flights again today in the wake of the terrorist attacks in New York and in Washington. Airline passengers are walking the halls of Tulsa International Airport, waiting word on when they possibly could take off. Since the incident happened, bomb squads have been combing the grounds, beefing up security. Airport officials say when they do get the okay from the FAA to let planes fly, they will be on highest sense of alert, and travelers say that's fine by them. It's got to be done, you know. You've got to feel sorry for the people around the flights uh, over in uh, you know, New York. So if they want to go through our luggage, fine. You know, People that's got something to hide, they're the ones that have the problem. As for the tarmac, it is still clear in Tulsa, but the FAA is allowing all emergency and law enforcement flights into the air on a case-by-case -case basis. News on 6 reporter Tammy Marler is at the airport, and she'll continue to monitor the situation there and have live reports coming up at noon. Several radio personalities from News Talk Radio KRMG 740, they fanned out across the city this morning, setting up camps at three different locations around town, distributing memorial ribbons to show Oklahoma support. Some pictures from the Golden Driller near 21st and Yale. Other locations included 71st and Garnett and 91st and Yale. KRMG says it gave out more than 100 ribbons at one single location. And many Tulsans are making a stop by our studios here this morning, dropping off donations of money to the Spirit of Oklahoma Crisis Relief Fund. The response so far, unbelievable. Rick Wells is outside. Rick? Yep, yep, you're absolutely right. In fact, I have two dollar bills here from two-year-old Madison, and Madison uh, came by here with her mom and dad, and she said, uh, hey, it's for you. And, uh, you know, it's just, and she was so cute. And these ladies right here, tell me your name. Dana Lutzkis. Hi, Dennis. And Melissa Abels. Hi, Melissa. And they are from? Boston Communications Group. And the employees went around, and they passed the hat, and they collected uh, some money, and the company then matched, right? Right. For $120. Yeah, for 120 bucks. So we got uh, $240 out of Boston Communications thanks to uh, some hard-working employees. Thank you all for coming by and bringing the money. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for, for being out here. Yeah, well, you're, it's our pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, ladies. All right, Kim Graham is wonderful? here. Oh, this is terrific. I tell you what, the giving just doesn't stop, and we just have to say thank you to everyone out there who's uh, taken the time to stop by and drop off a dollar or more. I mean, yep. the checks have ranged in uh, just... Well, we've had we had eighteen hundred dollars from one company. We've had uh, several one thousand dollar checks from from different businesses. We even had one lady come by in a uh, in a very expensive sports car with the top down, and she reached out and handed us a check for a thousand dollars. So people are people are doing their part. And Leanne is, and Kim and I have been talking about this out here. People just want to do something. They don't know. You know, it's so frustrating not to be able to to you know to know how you can help and. Uh, that's why we're out here, that's why the Red Cross is out here, and that's why they're collecting blood donations out at uh, 11th and Highway 169 and at the, at the uh, center a little further south at 77th and South Memorial. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, and again, we just want to let you know, if you think you don't have something to give, if you have 50 cents or a dollar, come on down. We want to shake your hand, and we just thank you for whatever it is that you Absolutely. can do. This has been great, folks. Thank yeah. you. Leanne will uh, we'll be here uh, through the noon hour and most of the afternoon, and there's a lady over here in this black car that wants yeah. to give her money to me, and she won't give it to anybody else, and I'm going to get her out of the middle of the street. So anyway, we'll, we'll be here, so come by and see us. All right, thank you very much. A reminder, if our location downtown is not as convenient for you, definitely uh, stop by the Red Cross, both locations, not only accepting the blood donations, but certainly cash donations as well. Volunteers are over at both of those locations to take your cash as well. Folks in green country still trying to come to grips with what happened yesterday. The events were on the minds of Tulsans, as you can imagine, trying to go about a normal routine today. Folks we talked with expressed a range of emotions this morning from shock to anger to sadness. Everyone that we spoke with said there is the need for Americans to come together. I was shocked. Very shocked. And uh, I feel terrible for the people involved, but I also feel anger. And it's just a time that we all have to come together. And uh, yeah. Realize what the possibilities are in our country.
Others we spoke with say they want the suspects in the terrorist attacks to be found quickly. Just very quickly, let me remind you, Tulsa International Airport closed today. As we have told you, airports across the country shut down, and we now understand the FAA has extended the flight ban indefinitely. So in terms of that noon deadline today, it will certainly pass, and it appears it could even be uh, as early as tomorrow before any more information about that becomes available. We will certainly keep you posted. If you have flight plans out of Tulsa today, uh, you are to call the airline, not the airport. Those phone numbers are running at the, cro at the bottom of your screen on the ticker. So grab a pencil and paper, jot those down, have those ready to get your information. We're going to return to CBS News coverage in New York on the attack on America, and we will have uh, an update beginning at noon with that interfaith service in downtown Tulsa. Stay with us. In Washington, Pentagon officials expect to find no more survivors of the attack there, though they now believe the number of dead will turn out to be well below 800. Secretary of Defense Ron Prell told uh, CBS's David Martin a short while ago that while he doesn't know what the final death toll will be at the Pentagon, Secretary Rumsfeld expects it to be, quote, well below the uh, estimated uh, by some 800. The FAA's unprecedented national ban on air traffic remains in place. This is a change from what was expected today. The air travel ban remains in place. Congress reconvened today amid tight security. President Bush has asked Congress to spend whatever it takes to recover from the terror attacks, which the president calls, and I quote him now, acts of war. Now for the impact on American business, on the economy, on financial markets, CBS News correspondent Anthony Mason. Dan, the impact by every measure is huge. I mean, as you've been talking about, first and foremost, there's, there's a personal impact. I mean, many of these companies today are still in an all-out search to find all of their employees. Uh, it wasn't just the World Trade Center. That obviously was, was the hardest hit. But you're talking about, I mean, around across the street from the World Trade Center is the World Financial Center, which is the global headquarters of Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, American Express has offices in there. Those buildings, which are also huge, are, are, are inaccessible today. Many thousands of financial workers can't even get to work. Some are trying to work from their homes. Uh, in the meantime, I've talked to corporate executives who literally have lists of their employees. They're going down them one by one, trying to find where all these people are. I think we can conservatively say there are hundreds, if not thousands, of financial employees still missing at this hour. Well, Anthony, we haven't talked at all about the effect on um, businesses. Let's take one area of the economy, uh, the airlines. Now, just in, Midway Airlines has announced it's suspending all flight operations. Hearing the FAA say they will no fly again today, Midway Airlines suspends all flight operations, and 1,700 people employed by Midway Airlines lose their jobs immediately. It's this sort of ripple effect in the economy that everybody has to be concerned about. Uh, there's, there's that immediate effect you're talking about, and, and what economists have been saying for the last two days is they're very concerned about a psychological impact. I mean, we've been talking for months here about an economy that's kind of teetering on the brink. Mm -hmm. And many people have said to me for some time, all you need is one little shock and we may not be able to take it. So the question here is how much psychological damage does it do to people? Are we gonna stop spending money because we just wanna sort of huddle in and feel safe and secure? If that ha happens, the whole, whole economy, not just you know, Midway Airlines, will come screeching to a halt and we'll, we'll, we'll tip into recession. Ed? Well, this is a company, Midway Airlines, that was experiencing economic problems before this. So this is that kind of ripple effect. This is the shock that you talk about that pushes them over the edge where they're canceling everything. On the international front, uh, the NATO Council, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization Council, may indeed invoke the Mutual Defense Clause in the wake of this attack on the U.S. Now, this is according to a high-ranking NATO official. This dovetails, Ed Bradley, with what you were talking about, at least we mentioned at the very top of the hour, that what President Bush is attempting to do, and this was the pattern his father, uh, President Bush the Elder, used in putting together a coalition uh, uh, to conduct the Gulf War, what they're trying to do is invoke this mutual defense clause, have NATO do that, which gives uh, um, immediately some weight and uh, of, a, of alliance for President Bush in his efforts to, to find who did this, 
uh, and to punish those who did it. Uh, if this actually happens, it's a very important development. That's the point yeah, here. I, th I think it's, it's good politically for the president. It's cover that he needs politically to show that he has the support of European allies. But the, the, the first problem that, that he has, that this country has, is who is the target? Who do you go after? In the Persian Gulf War, you had Saddam Hussein sitting in Kuwait. And it took seven, eight, nine months to, to mount a coalition to, to go into to Kuwait to move him out. At this point, who is the target? Who are we going after, even with the support of our European allies? And that's the question that has to be answered next. Absolutely. And the only reason for dwelling on this for as long as we have is invoking the mutual defense clause of NATO is no small step. And to have a NATO official indicate mm -hmm. that they are indeed moving in that direction is significant. Let's go down to John Frankel, who's in the Wall Street area here in New York. John? Uh, Dan, we are now standing at North Moor and the West Side Highway. We're probably about five blocks north from where the World Trade Centers stood. You can just maybe make out the smoke there. There's a, there's a helicopter flying over the scene now. The smoke now seems to be moving towards the east. That's the direction in which the wind is blowing. We've had an opportunity through the course of the morning to talk to several people, most of them volunteer rescue workers who have been close towards the wreckage. We want to describe some of the wreckage to you at first. We were over by the church and reed intersection and if you look down towards the area you can see there is a sort of awkward looking sculpture that's what it appears to be and what it actually is is the steel beams that sat on top of the world trade centers and when the buildings collapsed they fell straight down and were impaled in the ground we're also told that the rubble in many places is waist high there is a coating of dust on almost everything that wasn't burnt and and just disappeared completely uh, the area is under tight control at this time. Uh, we've been moved to, to certain areas and cornered off. Those people in the media who have tried to make their way closer to the site of the bombing have actually been taken away, some in handcuffs and moved off. The, the police officers in this area and the National Guard are keeping a really tight control of the area. Now, as you know, there have been reports of some people who have been rescued out of the wreckage. We know of uh, five firefighters and apparently two Port Authority policemen that have been rescued. We had a, a chance to speak to a Nassau police officer, a Richard Doer, who helped rescue one of those firefighters. The whole time down there, he was talking to us. Uh, his vitals were apparently in good shape. Uh, the New York City uh, medic and the doctor on the scene, uh, they kept him in good shape all through the night uh, with medication, uh, keeping his vitals up. Uh, they did a great job. We have also been told that why there is that handful of firefighters that have been rescued, the toll now around 220 firefighters, police officers, and other rescue personnel that have been confirmed dead. Last evening, some of those bodies were taken across the river and towards New Jersey. Now we're being told that a temporary morgue has been set up at the 91st Pier, which is uh, up by Chelsea Piers, about 23rd Street and the West Side Highway. Um, we also had an opportunity to talk to one of the other volunteers that came in from South Plainfield, New Jersey, a, an officer, Wayne Diana. And he was uh, situated in Middlesex County, New Jersey, and a whole bunch of volunteers were taken by bus to Staten Island last night and then ferried into Manhattan about midnight. And then they managed to make their way to Ground Zero uh, at the site of where the World Train Centers stood. He and some of his fellow officers were then positioned and asked to go through the rubble. He said that there wasn't any real orderly procedure to what was going on. There was really a lot of chaos. Uh, again, a lot of the debris, waist high, making their way through it. Some pieces extremely small, some pieces quite large that needed to be cut, steel beams that needed to be sliced by heavy machinery. I can tell you that along West Side, the West Side Highway here, uh, right now it seems to be that they've opened up the flow of traffic a little bit, but a lot of the vehicles, the major big construction rigs have been stacked up here. They're trying to get them down towards the scene as best they can. If I can offer one observation point for those who are New Yorkers and those who have visited New York, we have described the World Trade Center towers as landmarks, but they are also real guideposts for those people who come to New York. You look around, you don't know where you are, you see the trade centers, you know that that was south. That no longer exists. Dan? John Franklin, um, in the lower port of Manhattan, in our Washington Bureau is the, until recently, 
Secretary of Defense of the United States and former Senator, former Congressman Bill Cohen, who is now a CBS News consultant. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for being with us this morning. First of all, describe for us the significance of NATO invoking the mutual defense portion of our agreement with NATO, keeping in mind that they have not yet done that, but the indications are strong that they're right on the brink of doing it. Well, if they were to do that, uh, Dan, it sends a very uh, strong signal that all of the NATO members are prepared to support the United States uh, in its actions to defend uh, our freedoms. Uh, that's important uh, because this is uh, a declaration that an attack upon America is an attack upon all the members of the NATO itself. And that means that uh, they will be in it with us uh, to, to the end uh, in fighting this war. So that's a very significant uh, act uh, should it be taken. Now, how hard is it to find this terrorist? Well and good, our NATO allies say, well, they'll help us. We'll see whether they make good on that talk. But how hard is it to find out and to pinpoint who did this? It's a school of thought that says, listen, you, you'll never really find out for sure. Well, first, we have to be uh, somewhat cautious on this. I recall yesterday, for example, I was uh, in the process of conducting uh, an interview, and uh, there were reports about an explosion in Kabul in uh, Afghanistan, and immediately uh, it was concluded or assumed that this was the United States responding uh, by attacking uh, Kabul itself. Uh, I had to at least urge caution that it was more likely uh, to be a, a part of a civil war that was ongoing, and it turned out to be the case. So we've got to at least have some measure of caution before we jump to the final conclusion. In this particular case, I think all of the footprints would seem to lead uh, to Osama bin Laden or his associates. In that case, uh, we know from past experience that he has, in fact, been harbored. Uh, in Afghanistan. And so it's difficult to pinpoint exactly where he or his group may be at any given time. Uh, it is not difficult uh, to at least conclude that he's still in the country and has the, uh, the uh, safe passage and also the support uh, of uh, the, uh, the Taliban. So we know generally where he is, not, not specifically, but then again, uh, concerted action could be taken. Uh, to put the uh, Taliban on notice uh, that they will be held accountable, as President Bush said. There will be no distinction made between those who harbor uh, the terrorists and, and uh, those who are committing the acts themselves. This can require a, a variety of different responses, diplomatic, uh, economic, uh, isolation, ostracism from the international community, shutting down the level of commerce that they can conduct uh, with members of the international community, and then, of course, military action. Uh, Secretary Cohen, Ed Bradley here. I, is right. it significant, uh, we're told that the, the NATO officials are saying that they, this would be political support, but they would not necessarily supply military units or any other kind of military support to the United States. How well, significant is that? Uh, it's important that uh, our NATO allies, uh, as we say, belly up to the bar on this one. Uh, this is an attack upon freedom, as President Bush and others have uh, indicated. This is an assault upon civilization. They are part of that, to the extent that they simply say, we're behind you a thousand percent, but you go carry out the war because uh, we're not uh, prepared to bear the burdens of what response might be taken against us. It tells you something about the solidity and indeed the viability of NATO itself. So I think this is uh, not simply words here, but some deeds. And they're going to have to uh, uh, come to the, uh, the aid of one of their key NATO members, much as the United States also came to the aid when they were in doubt as to what they might do in Bosnia, in Kosovo, uh, and any other uh, potential uh, operation we might have to conduct. This is a mutual treaty and a mutual defense treaty, and we have been attacked. And so they can give us uh, more than words and will be required to do so. Mr. Secretary, what kind of retaliation could President Bush uh, expect uh, to do effectively? Again, there's a school of thought that says, listen, even if you find out who did it, it turns out what are you going to do in Afghanistan? What are his options? Well, I, I wouldn't want to uh, discuss uh, openly at least the options that the president will consider. There have been a number of contingency plans developed uh, by the, uh, the Pentagon, the military, uh, over the years uh, for a variety of uh, types of operations. And the president uh, obviously will look uh, at uh, this uh, schedule of, or menu, I would say, of, uh, of options and then decide whether or not it's feasible and will have, uh, be effective. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, also uh, indicate here another measure of caution. Whatever response the president decides upon, and he will have to do so within a reasonably short period of time, and I, I heard before that commentary was that, well, patience uh, is now being exercised, and that's true, and it should be. 
patience is a virtue, but it need not be eternal. There's going to be a time clock running here with the American people and what they expect the president to do. So on the one hand, he has to be patient to get all the facts. On the other hand, not too much time can be allowed to uh, transpire before he is called upon to take some sort of action. Second point is that what we have to do is to make sure whatever action is taken, be it diplomatic, uh, economic, or in this case uh, military, or a combination of all three, that it be really well thought out and well executed. The last thing we want to do is have what happened yesterday, is have the scene switch to uh, a, a fuel dump uh, exploding over in Kabul with uh, the focus being on what was taking place there. We want to remind the world and the American people what has happened on our soil. Those two trade towers have now collapsed with the assault upon the Pentagon. This is the image you want to keep very much in the mind of our allies as well as our adversaries, because this is what's going to galvanize the American people to sustain a long-term commitment against this war against terrorism. Former Secretary of Defense Bill Cohen, thank we'll be talking to you as the day and evening goes along. Let's check in now with our Chief Washington Correspondent, Bob Schieffer. Bob? Uh, good afternoon, Dan. You know, I was struck listening to former Secretary Cohen just now when he said that it's time and we're going to have to ask our allies, our NATO allies, to belly up to the bar. What struck me about that is those almost the exact words that Senator Ted Kennedy, a liberal Democrat from Massachusetts, said to me this morning uh, as I was coming into the Capitol. And I think that underscores the resolve that you're seeing at this Capitol. I'll tell you something, Dan. I don't know if it was Winston Church or whoever it was it said that is nothing quite so exhilarating as being shot at and missed the people at this capital think they were shot at uh, when they evacuated this capital yesterday and people were running out of this capital it was because the police had told them there was an aircraft coming toward the capital now whether that was or not whether the plane that crashed in uh, pennsylvania was indeed headed for the capital perhaps we will never know but people here thought that it was. They are taking this personally. Uh, I've never seen such unity. Trent Lott was on the floor of the Senate today saying we need to be on a war footing. When the president said this was an act of war, it was what Democrats and Republicans were waiting to see here. Uh, Tom Daschle, the leader of the Democrats, in another show of unity, uh, said, I am outraged as a senator at these acts. Now, uh, both houses are going to pass a joint resolution strongly supporting the president in tracking down and punishing uh, the people who did this. Then later tonight, there's going to be a prayer vigil here. But this, this was a shaken capital, Dan, and people here are not going to soon forget uh, the events of yesterday. Bob Schieffer. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Leanne Taylor. We do have some breaking news to pass along locally that certainly is part of the attack on America. The FAA has made an immediate request that all airports across the country, including Tulsa International Airport, be evacuated. They're calling it a re-sterilization. They want everyone that is not an authorized personnel out of the airports across the country. So as you can imagine, the crews that are out there covering this story for us locally are going to be moving over the next few minutes. We will have the very latest coming up at noon. But once again, Obviously, airports close, but now the FAA is requiring that all airports across the country have a full security sweep. That means all uh, non-authorized personnel will be asked to leave the airport area. They can remain on the grounds, but the building itself will be swept with bomb dogs and other security personnel. We will have the very latest coming up at noon. Keep it right here. On the 735 train from Locust Manor in Queens on the Long Island Railroad, and a couple of her friends said she went inside the building when the first plane hit. I don't know if she went upstairs or if she was downstairs, but uh, that was the last I heard from her. And where have you been looking? How have you been looking? Um, we've been calling on phones. Um, today was the first day we, they allowed us to come into the city. Uh, we've been to, I went to Bellevue right across from me. I went to Beth Israel. We stand online at NYU. I got my brothers who's on the other side of town at St. Vincent and Lenox Hill. I got another brother who's in Jersey checking those hospitals out. I have another brother who works for the MTA that's checking out all those people that was in the subways. So my whole family and all my close friends, are, we just just putting the message out, just hoping that she's alive and tell her to call home. That's all. That's all we want. Sean Manning, good luck to you and thanks for talking to us. Thank morning. you, Dad. Thank, Thank you for giving me a time. Ed Bradley, here we, we have, you know, we, we talk about NATO invoking its mutual uh, 
uh, defense pact. We talk about the impact on financial markets, Midway Airlines suspending operation, firing people. But here, in, in microcosm, with this young man desperately searching for his wife, this is the cutting edge of this story right now, and it will remain that way for quite a while. And, and I think a lot of people remember the, the Murrah bombing in Oklahoma City, where you had rescue workers pulling people out, I think, for 15 days, 15 days after the explosion. They found someone alive and, pull, and pulled them out. And I think there is that kind of hope that, that people have. But the difference between the Murrah building in Oklahoma City and the World Trade Center, there you had eight, nine stories collapsing. Here, you had more than 100 stories coming down on top of people there. And the, the reality is that, yes, some people will survive, but it's much more difficult to survive that than to survive the Murrah building in, in Oklahoma City. Anthony Mason, you spoke earlier that, yes, there's an effect on the economy, yes, there's an effect on the markets. The World Trade Center was right at, right at the heart uh, of, of Wall Street and trading. But so many of the people who worked uh, there are searching for their, searching for survivors first, searching for their own family members, and never mind the accounts, never mind what's happening to the economy, uh, the economy of the market. People come first, Dan. In in we've we've talked about this in many ways, but in in every town around New York City, in every suburb in New Jersey, in Westchester County, in Rockland County, somebody knows somebody who's got somebody who works down you know, at the World Trade Center or Wall Street. I mean, I know the wife of a minister last night in the town where I live spent her whole evening calling every member of the congregation to make sure everybody was home. And I know somebody in that town who did not come home. And I think everybody in New York City has a connection like that right now. So everybody is feeling in this area, is feeling this, this very personally right now. And that is the heartbeat of this city at this moment. Let's go to Washington and Bob Orr for more information on what is and is not happening with America's airlines and our transportation system, Bob. Well, Dan, for the moment, all flights remain grounded. We're still in this unprecedented national ground stop. And frankly, the people inside the FAA are wrestling with what to do. Do they, do they take the risk of opening the system too soon, or do they go too slowly and send the message me. that the system has been Sister badly Caddy. damaged? While that's going on, though, there are some interesting new developments that we're learning American about that tell us a little bit more about uh, exactly the sophistication involved with the hijackers who took control of these airplanes. From sources today, we understand that in at least two of the cases, two of the four uh, airplanes, the transponders were apparently deliberately turned off. Now, transponders basically are uh, radio signals that send information to controllers about the plane's altitude, uh, the speed, generally the direction. It is the main radar signature. But we believe now that in the second jet that hit the World Trade Center and in the plane that came uh, into the Pentagon, that these transponders were turned off. Now somebody has to know a little bit about cockpits to know how to do that. The importance of that is that for a while these planes, these flying bombs loaded with fuel, uh, were flying there where air traffic controllers didn't have a real good sense of exactly where they were, didn't know how high they were, didn't know exactly where they were going, didn't know their speed. That's important because if there was any level of warning after the first attack at the World Trade Center, the second one came in and at least for the last bit was flying blind. So the air traffic controllers could only watch in horror on the radar screens without knowing a whole lot about what that plane was doing, Dan. Bob Orr, live in our Washington bureau. Let me show you something now that we weren't able to show you before. This is a new bit of video, give you some perspective on what happened yesterday from the space station, high in space. This is what it looked like as the World Trade Center was hit. And the smoke from the fires. Our prayers and thoughts go out to all the people there and uh, everywhere else here. I'm looking up and down the East Coast to see if I can see anything else. And um, to the people in Washington. Now, the astronaut up there talking where you can see right in the lower right hand part of your screen a, a huge white blob. Keep in mind the distance up. I don't know offhand, but something like 150 or 80 miles up to see that picture. If we could re-rack that tape for just a moment. And from that high up, you could you have this sweep of the east coast of New York Harbor, and then, you know, the fire and smoke. It was one thing to show you a picture for some rooftop uh, here in 
Manhattan, another to show you the bellowing smoke just moving along the street like some monster, a monster it was. It's another to see it from that high up in space. Perhaps we can get that picture up for you as time goes along. If you were at home anywhere in the country and asking yourself, what can I do? I mean, is there anything I can do? You may want to consider uh, contacting the Red Cross or your local hospital to try to donate blood. Now, I want to make sure that there's an understanding here that some places uh, in New York, in New York City, particularly in Manhattan, or in the, over the last 24 hours, they said, look, we, we have enough blood for the next four or five days, but we don't know where we're going. Right now, we're told that there are urgent appeals for blood across the country. Now, blood supplies have been in, in short supply uh, for some little while. So if you're asking yourself, what can I do? Consider contacting the Red Cross, your local hospital, and uh, give some blood. If it doesn't help directly in what's happening in New York and Washington today, it will wind up helping someone. Now, we reported earlier, but we want to underscore that while the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, intended to lift its ban on flights, at the very minimum airline flights, some of them around noon Eastern time today, they decided at the last minute not to do that. No airlines are, are flying today. None will be scheduled to fly today. And those of you who are traveling or intend to travel need to keep in mind that when the ban is lifted on flights, and let us hope it will be sometime over the next 24 hours, even when it's lifted, it doesn't mean right away that the air service is going to be um, up to what it was before uh, these cataclysmic events that have happened over the last 24 hours because airplanes are out of place, crews are out of place. So you just want to keep that in mind. And also you have to be prepared, as Anthony Mason noted earlier, and I think Ed Bradley as well, uh, there are going to be uh, uh, extensive security measures like you have never seen before at any airport. So the situation in the airports, it isn't a matter that, well, things are going to get pretty much back to normal sometime in the next 24, 48 hours. It simply isn't going to happen. Ed Bradley. Well, and, and also, we've had warnings about this, Dan. I mean, this is, this is nothing new. But the, the GAO and the Inspector General found problems with uh, both the, the people who uh, work at airports screening luggage and, and checking passengers as well as the equipment that they used. Uh, there was a report from the GAO in June of 2000 that airport screeners had missed as many as 20 percent of dangerous objects during tests. Uh, so it, it's not as if that this comes to us as a surprise. We've had warnings by official government agencies before. Well, let one say gently, nor should it have come as a surprise to us. Uh, that there was no, we didn't treasure, we didn't put high value on the people responsible for airport security. Low, low paid, and this is not to denigrate anybody involved with airport security, but it was, let's face it, it was pretty much a kiss off by the airlines and everybody else. Now there have been various calls for federal uh, agencies to take over the security of U.S. airports. After all, these airports belong to the people of the United States, not to the airlines. Whether that will go anywhere, I don't know. We did have uh, sky marshals for, for a while in the late 70s on into the 1980s. They were done away with. I, my assumption is, Anthony Mason helped me, that one reason we did away with them uh, was a matter of budget, uh, of money. Well, it's, I, I don't recall the reason myself, Dan, but I mean, anybody who's been through an airport knows the security isn't as stringent as, as it could be. To some degree, I think we're to blame for that. We're used to, to moving fast and we don't like to be inconvenienced. So, I mean, when you have, on the days when I've seen tough security at airports, you see an awful lot of passengers complaining. Well, that's true. And as Secretary Cohen uh, said uh, at some point in the hours preceding, uh, we need to have a national discussion of security versus civil liberties. Right. Uh, that's to say nothing of our desire to get moving and get through the airport very quickly. All of this will be in the process of uh, reassessment over the weeks and months to come. I want to come back to in a few seconds we have remaining here before we go to our uh, break at one o'clock in the east, that we have a situation here where, you know, we want the country to be steady. We, we, we want to get back to as close as normal as we can for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which to show those who made this attack on us uh, that, that, yes, they hit us a lick, they knocked us down, but we got up. But as the hours go by, and we're now into the second day, the enormity of actually doing that is beginning to sink in. It is not going to be easy. It is going to take time with all of these things we've talked about. Yeah. Uh, and there's also the concern that is there another shoe to drop? Yeah that we have to get our system back up to normal. 
our flight system, our economic system, the Wall Street open again, and all things going as best they can uh, as they were before. But there has to be concern by the government, by security officials, is that is there a second page to these attacks? Mm -hmm. Was this just a, a, a one-day event uh, with no follow-up? Uh, or is there something else planned? Is it an effect of war? I mean... For example, they've closed the Potomac River uh, north of the Woodrow Wilson Bridge in Washington. Ed, you're watching continuing CBS News coverage of Attack on America. This is the News on 6, a special edition. Attack on America. Good afternoon, I'm Leanne Taylor. We are continuing to monitor national coverage, but we want to take a break just very quickly to update you on the noon service, the interfaith service that is scheduled to begin here momentarily. Hundreds of people had gathered on the uh, County Courthouse Plaza area there at 5th and Denver for the service, the interfaith service that will include Tulsa Metropolitan Ministries, the National Conference for Community Justice, the Jewish Federation of Tulsa, the Islamic Society of Tulsa. Tulsa's mayor will be there as will Commissioner John Self. This special interfaith service was called for today because of the tragedy in New York and Washington DC. There will be special music and presentations by officials here uh, in the Tulsa and County areas in light of yesterday's attack. And we'll take you there live as soon as that service begins so that you may be a part of that. Many of you want to contribute in some small way to the tragedy that happened uh, hundreds of miles away in New York and in Washington, D.C. Rick Wells has been out this morning throughout. Just coming in, hoping against hope that they can be here maybe when the airport reopens. Well, they're going to move all of those people out. The only people who will remain inside the terminal will be the airline employees, the rent car employees, and other essential uh, employees of the airport. For about three hours, they're going to take bomb dogs and airport and Tulsa police through the terminal, search the entire terminal, make sure that it is 100% clean. They call that sanitizing it, making sure there are no foreign objects in there, no suspicious objects, and no people inside the airport. After that, they will set up their new security procedures and start allowing people back into the airport. They said that the first flights could leave Tulsa sometime this evening. But travelers are going to have to put up with uh, some very severe security restrictions, including some of the following. There will not be any SkyCab service. There will not be any curbside drop-off of baggage to check in or get ticketed. All baggage will have to be taken into the airport and dealt with at the baggage terminals there and at the ticket booths there. There will also not be any cars parked up on the arrival or departure uh, little alleyways here. Those cars will not be allowed to be parked and will not be allowed to be left unattended. Also, any carry-on baggage, passengers should expect that to be hand-searched and we are told passengers should expect anything that looks suspicious or anything that the security officer has a question about, expect that to be taken apart and looked at as well. We're also told that there will not be, not be any pocket knives, any bladed instrument allowed on a passenger getting on an airplane. Uh, we were asked about other things like small uh, utility tools, small screwdrivers, things like that. That's something they've still got to work with, but any bladed object is off limits. It will not be allowed past the checkpoint. Also, uh, travelers, only ticketed travelers, will be allowed past the metal detectors to go on down toward the gates. So these are very different restrictions, very uh, severe may not be the word, but uh, very stringent restrictions that will now be put in place. And it will take some time for travelers and the airport people to get used to this, but it will be much different. Possibly the first flights go out tonight. If you're coming, get here very, very early. Call the airline first to make sure your flight's going to leave. Then. And Chad, very interesting changes there, and of course very understandable, but very important for people to go ahead and call their airlines because the logistical situation nationally with all of these flights trying to get back to where they were because they had to land so quickly, not where they were destined, and then you have today's flights trying to catch up. So I would expect people should have to really try and be very patient and wait, even though they think they might leave tonight. They may not because of all the logistics in the air. Well, right, and there's two ways to look at that. Number one, for yourself, you don't want to get out here and go through what might be a two or three hour check-in process only to find out that your plane is not leaving. Then, on the other hand, if you're in the mix, 
and in that process and your plane's not leaving all you're doing is holding other passengers up and holding the other airlines up so those are both ways to look at it and yes the best idea is to call the airline uh, we do on our team tulsa website have postings of those numbers where you can call the airline and see if your flight is on time all of the airlines serviced out of tulsa are on that listing with 800 numbers all right good point chad thank you so much for that update now information coming out of Tulsa International Airport that flights could be resuming this evening with much, much more strict security measures. We'll bring you more updates on the local situation here in Tulsa as they warrant. And, uh, talking on the telephone with federal law enforcement officials, they say that some arrests are being made this morning in connection with the terrorist attacks. They're describing these people as material witness warrants. The officials say the arrests are being made when the people decline to answer questions or otherwise cooperate. This is at the Weston Copley Hotel. The FBI bomb squad is inside. That's in Boston. Two of the flights originated at Logan Airport in the Boston area, obviously. Uh, we don't know whether this is, in fact, just a report of a bomb or if couple they, in fact, have agents found one. It's the Weston Copley Hotel in Boston. And hotel. we're going to go to NBC's and Andrea Mitchell now, who is in Washington as well. She's been tracking not only uh, the national security matters, but this law enforcement investigation that is going around the world. So, Andrea, uh, Pete Williams is reporting that they are now uh, issuing some material witness warrants for arrest in this case. Exactly. Now, we should stress that these are not... Uh, in any way necessarily people who are complicit right now, or are involved uh, in the acts of terror. The, uh, These are material witness warrants for people who may have seen something or may have some other tangential involvement. People who may have perhaps even unwittingly assisted these terrorists along the way. But as you know, the FBI spread out in Florida following up uh, a clue from one of the flight manifests and did an extensive search in Broward County, Florida last night. And we have other reports from other uh, members of the NBC News team, Julie Holstein, reporting that in Portland, Maine, a police chief spoke at a press conference this morning, Tom, and said that the FBI had directed his department to focus on two men who were on the U.S. air flight that left Maine at 6 a.m. yesterday and that landed at Logan at 6.30 a.m., where, of course, they could have connected to several of the other flights, to two other flights. Um, the FBI believes, Tom, that the two men spent Monday night in Maine, that they rented a blue Nissan Optima from Alamo rental, car rental in Maine, that they had carry-on bags and had to go through security again at Logan because the plane was in a different concourse. So they are really zeroing in on a number of these, these uh, players. People on the manifest and also, as you point out from Pete Williams' note, the FBI now putting out arrest warrants for people who may have been material witnesses. All right, uh, uh, that's uh, NBC's Andrea Mitchell in Washington. We continue to watch these developments in Boston. The crowd has been pushed back from that hotel, which is in the heart of Boston. Let's listen for just a few moments to our affiliates' coverage here, WHDH Television, Channel 7 in Boston. And so it's hard to try and figure out how the two connect. Now try to uh, regain contact with Christine McKenna, I'll ask our producers uh, to do that as we talk once again with Garvin Thomas, who's at Copley Plaza right now. Garvin? Uh, Jonathan, I, I guess it's, it's, it's a very... Uh, it's a very strange scene out here. Uh, obviously, the, by now, I would say the crowd that is outside here is, is probably numbering in the thousands of people just on the street alone. I notice a crowd that's gathered across the street in front of the, uh, the Copley Plaza Hotel as well. Everybody wondering what is going on here, trying to figure out if it has any connection to what happened in New York City yesterday. As I said, the scene is, a, is about a half an hour old when the first emergency workers responded to a call here at the Westin Hotel. We've seen quite a response. Uh, as I said, I see in count three ambulances in front. There was a, uh, a SWAT team which arrived about 15, 20 minutes ago. I'd say about a dozen members uh, fully uh, <clears throat> outfitted uh, in, in their Kevlar gear and helmets and shields. I, I think I noticed a battering ram at one point going in. Uh, they carried in some cases as well, which I can only speculate might be some materials used to investigate or defuse bombs or maybe some crime scene 
investigation tape. Uh, they, they went in about 15 minutes ago. Uh, they have not then, the police have not been too concerned uh, with the safety, it appears, of the people who are outside, uh, outside the area now. Uh, they, it appears they have not evacuated the hotel. As I look up on some of the floors and peer in some of the windows. I noticed, uh, I noticed some, some obviously very curious resident or, uh, residents of the hotel. As you can see, another uh, another ambulance uh, arriving on scene here. The the picture you're looking at right now, uh, courtesy of what we call our mass cam. It's located right, on top. We're going to continue to monitor the, the situation in camp. Boston, and we'll go immediately back to it as soon as there are some concrete developments. We want to return to Washington now, and NBC's Andrea Mitchell, as this investigation begins to take up pace. Andrea? Well, as you know, Tom, what they have been doing for the last 24 hours or um, 36 hours since all of this developed was to go back over any intelligence, any warnings, any cues that might have been missed, and also to look prospectively. So you have uh, intelligence operatives around the world from all of our agencies working together in Langley at the counter terrorist center, but also sending out directives to try to warn other terror groups not to think that the U.S. is vulnerable, not to try to make any kind of copycat attempt, not that anyone could, but there are freelancers, there are smaller operations that could try to imitate what has been achieved by these terrorists against the United States. And part of this is to look to see if anyone else is also making threats. Now, part of what they're doing, obviously, is also pursuing the investigation. And as we've been reporting since yesterday, the primary suspect in their light, uh, with a great deal of evidence that is mounting, is the operation and groups associated with Osama bin Laden. They have warned people in the region. They have talked uh, through the Pakistanis, have sent, we are told by briefers who were briefing in Washington today, that a Pakistani military delegation has gone to Kabul to speak to the Taliban leaders and let them know that if there ever were time to avoid retaliation and do something cooperatively with Osama bin Laden, that moment is now. Tom? All right, thanks very much, uh, NBC's Andrea Mitchell. As we continue to watch the situation in Boston, we're beginning to get uh, more names that are being released by the airlines, but the news continues not to be good uh, out of the World Trade Center area, where they continue to search for bodies and for people who may still be alive. There were reports last night that some people were on their cell phones saying, trying to uh, tell searchers where they were at that time. Some better news, however, in Washington today in terms of the death toll at the Pentagon. At one point last night, we were told that as many as 800 mostly military personnel had been killed when the uh, airliner was driven into the side of the Pentagon yesterday morning, shortly after the attack on the World Trade Center. NBC's Jim Mikloszewski is there for us again today. Jim, what is the latest on the count there? Well, the, Tom, according to Pentagon officials, the latest uh, death toll here at the Pentagon appears to be just over 100. Some 40 to 50 Army personnel, both military and civilian. Some 40 to 50 uh, Army or, or Navy, again, civilian and military. And approximately seven uh, defense intelligence employees, all civilians, according to officials here in the Pentagon. There was some confusion here yesterday. Uh, that entire area that was hit by this airliner yesterday is an area in transition. A lot of people moving into offices, out of offices. And so when everybody scattered, it was difficult to keep track. And it wasn't until this morning when people started to report back to work that they actually started to get a much better number on those still missing. And uh, they've narrowed it down to approximately uh, 100 uh, or 107 uh, at, uh, uh, they hope, anyway, at the maximum. But uh, they say that it will take at least a week uh, before uh, rescue workers and recovery operations uh, can, can really be concluded in that region because the area is still so unstable. Uh, it's, a, it's a danger to rescue workers and uh, because uh, some fires continue to burn there. In fact, a short time ago, Tom, they put out uh, an alert and, and, and were ready to evacuate the entire building because uh, a hot spot had occurred in the, in the roof above us, uh, but then they, they got that contained and uh, they decided we could stay. Uh, but very unstable in that entire section, uh, so it's going to be some time before we get any kind of exact uh, casualty count out of there. But we are told that notification of next of kin has already begun and perhaps uh, Secretary Rumsfeld himself 
uh, will talk to us later this afternoon uh, uh, to give us uh, that information. Tom. All right. Thanks, uh, NBC's Jim Mikloszewski. We have on the telephone now our Justice Department correspondent, Pete Williams, who was uh, in the back country of the American West when all of this happened. He's now in Denver and he's been working the telephones. He did report to us that material witness warrants have been issued. They're beginning to pick up people who f refuse to cooperate with investigators. Pete, you expect that we're going to see more incidents like the one that we're witnessing right now in Boston? Yes, Tom. Federal law enforcement officials say we're going to see a lot of this in the coming days. People taken into custody, anyone who has any potential connection with the suspected terrorists, uh, for whom the authorities wish to get it, keep track of, and they may want to ask them additional questions. Anyone who isn't completely cooperative with agents will probably be arrested on material witness warrants. We saw a lot of the similar kind of thing, although certainly not on this scale, uh, in the days and weeks leading up to the millennium, when uh, after the uh, uh, Ahmed Rissam came across the border with a car full of explosives and immediately the FBI and other law enforcement officials began to try to figure out how extensive this potential terrorist network was, and they were making a, and these material witness warrants all over the country, knocking on doors, uh, going up alleys into apartments all over the country, and we're going to be seeing this probably on a much bigger scale in the coming days, authorities say. Now, they caution us to say that even as they make these arrests, uh, we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that these people necessarily are connected to the terror plot, that it could be they're simply people who are, for whatever reasons, not being cooperative. And it's possible, they say, that some of these people could ultimately be released if it turns out they have no connection. So they, they caution us to not jump to any conclusions as we watch these arrests being made. All right. Uh, Pete Williams in Denver, what else can you tell us about the nature of the investigation? Is this going on not just in this country but around the world as well? Are they asking international authorities to cooperate with us? Absolutely, although uh, obviously the FBI's power to make arrests uh, is, is considerably different overseas. Uh, anyone they wanted to detain, they'd have to get host nation cooperation to do that, and I don't get any indication that they're near that at this point. But we do have many outposts overseas. That was established under Louis Free, who did have this grave concern about an international network of terrorism directed at this country. That's right. We heard John Ashcroft yesterday afternoon, the Attorney General, use that somewhat unfamiliar term, legats, that the FBI has around the country. That's short for legal attaches, FBI agents assigned to American embassies in major cities around the world. And he already indicated last night that uh, they're very actively going after uh, chasing leads in, in uh, their cities as well. All right, thanks very much, uh, NBC's Pete Williams. Let's go to Boston now, and one of our crack investigative reporters, Chris Hansen of Dateline NBC. Boston, of course, is ground zero for this investigation because two of the planes were taken from there. Chris? Absolutely, Tom. Good afternoon. Uh, the scene that you've been watching at the uh, Copley Plaza Hotel in Boston has been uh, repeated to a, a lesser degree all over town today. From talking to investigative sources in and around the airport here, uh, FBI agents and state police have been uh, interviewing cab drivers who may or may not have knowledge of uh, the people involved in this. They've been talking to baggage handlers uh, who are familiar with perhaps some of the subjects. And federal investigators are confirming that they do believe that there is an actual terrorist cell here in the Boston area with direct links to Osama bin Laden. And that's part of what's made this uh, such an aggressive investigation today, such a fast-moving investigation today. Uh, officially, FBI agents here are not saying much. They're saying that uh, uh, the word is going to come out of Washington, but we can tell you that there are literally hundreds of investigators here at the airport uh, talking to virtually every human being that had anything to do with the flights that uh, took off and ultimately smashed into the World Trade Center, Tom. Okay, uh, NBC's uh, Chris Hansen, who is at Logan Airport in uh, Boston. Chris, just tell us, uh, as a matter of uh, other interest, of course, what happened to airport security there today? Well, airport security is going to uh, uh, increase incredibly here. No longer will... Um there will be uh, a curbside uh, baggage check-in. They're going to keep all vehicles 300 yards away from uh, any airport uh, building. Uh, there will be more ID checks, and only ticketed passengers um, will be allowed into the, uh, into the secure areas of the airport. There have been some other developments here, Tom, that are interesting. 
uh, reports uh, circulating uh, uh, from uh, investigators that perhaps uh, there were three people who bought one-way tickets on this flight at the very last minute and boarded like perhaps 11 minutes uh, prior to the flight. Uh, as you know, they found this uh, vehicle here today, or, or rather yesterday, that has uh, been tied to um, at least two of the suspects in the vehicle, they found uh, uh, flight uh, training manuals in Arabic. They have linked this car to uh, two uh, brothers who have passports from the United Arab Emirates, and one of them is a trained pilot. They think that they are among those who uh, were the hijackers, and uh, there is every indication now from federal sources that they have pretty much identified all of the hijackers uh, who took part in this uh, on the planes, uh, at least coming from Boston, Tom. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dateline's Chris Hansen, now our affiliate, WHDH in Boston, has reported point, that one person was wounded hotel, in this so uh, hotel incident, whatever it was. We just know that there was a massive show of law enforcement there. There was a van parked outside. It has since departed the hotel, but we don't know what went on inside. Again, uh, our affiliate there is saying that they have a report that one person was wounded. We'll try to get that sorted out to you. Uh, there are names now attached to, to these hijackings, and two of them, Mohammed Atta and Marwan El Shahi, that's S H E H H I, uh, that they took some pilot training when they were in Florida. And the pilot examiner who uh, certified them said his records show that they were certified in November and December of the year 2000. He's still sort of, uh, sorting out which man was certified first. They were certified in a Piper Seneca, which is a piston engine. Uh, it's a small airplane, obviously. Experienced pilots on this plane say that if you do not have to land or take off a Boeing 757 or a 767, you would likely be able to fly one of those jets after being certified in the Piper Seneca. Once those uh, big uh, airliners are airborne, it is not all that difficult to maneuver them. And obviously, the terrorists were at the control yesterday at the controls of those two planes that flew into the World Trade Center and at the Pentagon. And we don't know what happened to the plane that went down just outside of Philadelphia. Let's go to NBC's Ann Curry now, who is in lower Manhattan, where the search and rescue efforts continue underway. Ann? As you know, Tom, it is an intense search and rescue effort. I've been down here all morning, and earlier we were taken down to Grand Zero, Ground Zero, right at Versi and uh, Vesey and West, which is just right in front of the World Trade Center building number one. And we saw the collateral damage is intense. Number one, uh, building number one is just a couple stories, maybe even just one or two stories still standing. And behind it, you can only see, you can see the wreckage of building number two. Off to the side, building number seven, as you know, is down. Is it was still smoking as of early this morning and there is still some smoke coming out of it although some of that may be simply smoldering smoke it's gone on and off again the fire there and then also we should probably tell you from having been on the scene that that the collateral damage is intense the customs building which is building number six has been severely impacted there are buildings all around that have been severely impacted in fact one nearby building uh, had a gaping hole about three stories high also windows blown out a block and a half away so there's been a lot of intense damage down here. Also, we should probably tell you uh, that the rescuers are searching, doing the best they can and finding everybody. They brought in cranes, all kinds of heavy equipment. In addition, however, they also have robotics. Robot, robot machines. We hear some planes going overhead. I know they're police helicopters. That sounded like a military jet, and which have the military jets have been flying over this area, by the way, and the National Guard is on the scene. Uh, we've seen robotic machines that they're sending in. They brought them in this morning. They go down. They're able to go where there's so much structural damage, so much structural instability that they, uh, uh, that they feel this is the only safe way to look for people who might still be alive. So what they're doing is they're sending these machines down, and these machines can send back uh, uh, not only images, but they can also send back uh, information as to whether there is movement. They've also brought in infrared uh, devices so that they can tell whether there is heat underneath the rubble. But it's a very, very intense job for them to, to find people who are still alive using infrared because there's also some hot spots, as you can see. Um, we should also tell you that this morning we have confirmed from uh, uh, New York uh, Fire Department Chief, Battalion Chief Kevin Burns, confirmed to us that there was one person who was rescued this morning. He would not identify that person, uh, whether it was a man or a woman, a rescuer or, or, or a uh, 
person who was in the building, uh, but he said that person is in the hospital and alive. And one more uh, bit of uh, information for you. We did also see um, a truck uh, loaded with gas tanks being brought in. And when we asked what those were for, we were told that while the primary focus out here is to find people who may still be alive under this rubble, they are also efforting an attempt to find those black boxes, which were aboard, of course, both of those two planes that went down. They br brought in the gas tank so they can fuel the device that they need to use to cut through metal. They may be separating uh, the people who need to find those black boxes from the devices themselves. So there is a very intense effort. We have since this morning been pushed back from ground zero. And so we're attempting to show you those pictures from above buildings uh, and talking to whoever we can to get you more information, Tom. Back to you. All right. Thanks very much, uh, Ann Curry of NBC's Today program uh, on duty and uh, in the middle of it all in lower Manhattan today reporting on the continuing search and rescue effort that is underway there. WHDH, our affiliate in Boston, let's listen to them for just a few moments. We did see that incident at the hotel there. They're now saying that someone has been arrested. Uh, there's a few staff members who I talked to, um, not officials for the hotel, but uh, the people who are just giving out information as they get it. Um, they're just saying they're under the impression that police and FBI agents are here. Um, they've been told because uh, there could be something that's connected to the terrorist activity in the last 36 hours or so, and that uh, they they're just want to see that through. But no, uh, nobody I've talked to has had any information that there's been any um, specific purpose for all of these EMS and ambulances to be standing by. Christina, we are getting uh, some information from our colleague at NBC, Pete Williams, uh, who is fairly well connected, that in fact authorities are looking for, quote, potential connections uh, to terrorists there at the Westin, that they're looking for material witnesses, and that one of many, oper it is one of many operations to come. However, considering the fact that apparently we do have one person injured and is about to be uh, transported, and one person reportedly in custody and I caution our audience that uh, with any type of breaking news like this with unofficial information and sometimes hearsay we have to take all of this a bit with a grain of salt but clearly there's uh, quite a bit unfolding here at the Westin right now because we do have some right, conflicting uh, scenes so here with that Christina is an unconfirmed the report that there's been an arrest at the Westin Hotel, the Copley Hotel, which is in the heart of Boston. Logan Airport was the, uh, the takeoff site, obviously, for two of the airliners that were used in yesterday's terrorist attacks. And they have identified people who went from Portland, Maine to Logan and boarded those two airplanes. And in fact, uh, two of the men, it appears, did receive some kind of pilot training in Florida last year in the fall of last year. Here's an intriguing development. Uh, we have in uh, Asia, Rati Santra in Singapore. She works for CNBC. She simply dialed the foreign ministry in Kabul and asked if Osama bin Laden is still in Afghanistan. And the Taliban official said that she talked to, yes, he is. I can confirm that because I have seen him. But then he wouldn't uh, answer further questions, saying that he, she would have to talk with the foreign minister himself. But she did say that he did say that Osama bin Laden is in Afghanistan. There is a Pakistani military delegation en route to Afghanistan right now, apparently with a very stern message to the Taliban, uh, that uh, radical and very fundamentalist uh, Islamic group that has taken over that country and is widely believed to be harboring Osama bin Laden, the man that most people think is the chief suspect in this terrorist war that has been declared on the United States. One of America's leading journalistic authorities on that part of the world is at Newsweek magazine now. He is the Middle Eastern regional editor, an old friend of mine, Chris Dickey. We spent a fair amount of time in that part of the world. But Chris, the equation has certainly changed in the last 24 hours or so. Nobody ever imagined anything like this. I think that's one of the great problems. The terrorists were a lot more imaginative than the people who were defending the country. What do we know about Osama bin Laden's operation? Uh, the sophistication of it. Yesterday's very complex and I dare say in the darkest sense of the word brilliantly executed terrorist attack against this country shows that he has a very wide reach. Yeah, I think the thing that you have to recognize about yesterday's operation is the reason it worked was really what the intelligence people call tradecraft, not technology. The technology was minimal, almost non-existent, razor blades, small knives, uh, what, what made this operation a success from the terrorist point of view uh, was intelligence gathering, surveillance, uh, making a lot of very good judgments about where vulnerabilities were that security officials were not paying much attention to, and then exploiting those to the max. 
And that's why we had such a disaster yesterday. Uh, Chris, what about the reaction of the other Arab states? King Abdullah of Jordan has been on the air today saying that he condemned those small-scale celebrations in Palestine in the, on the West Bank by the young Palestinians that upset so many Americans. But the rest of the Arab world, by and large, has been reasonably muted during all of this. Well, I think that you have to look at differences of opinion in the Arab world. A lot of Arabs resent American support for Israel. There's no doubt about that. But they also love America, and they love Americans. I think that a lot of the initial reaction was a reaction to the striking against the symbols of American power. But I think very quickly, most Arabs, the vast majority of Arabs, decided that they really could not bear the idea of so many people being killed, so many is innocents being killed. I think the reaction is going to be more and more emotional and more and more pro-American, in fact, in the Arab world. All right, thank you very much. Chris Dickey, who is a regional editor in the Middle East for Newsweek magazine. Thanks for sharing that with us, and uh, we'll probably be talking to you again during the course of the next uh, several days ago or so. Let's go back up to Boston now, and Dateline's Chris Hansen, who is there. There are any number of reports of some arrest or something going on in that city as law enforcement officers fan out across Boston, the home of Logan Airport, which was where two of those airliners uh, were hijacked shortly after takeoff yesterday. Chris? Well, uh, as you probably know, Tom, uh, there are a lot of connections in this area uh, to Osama bin Laden. As we mentioned before, uh, investigators believe that there is a true terrorist cell here with connections. But there are also uh, just a lot of other people in the community that the investigators want to talk to to see if they have any knowledge of what was going on here. These things are, are never carried out by, by a handful of, of people. There's, there's, you know, it takes a lot of people to get, to get something like this uh, off the ground. And I'll give you an example of some of the things that they're pursuing today. Um, there are a number of cab drivers who investigators think have knowledge uh, of, of perhaps what was going to take place here, as well as um, a number of potential airport employees. And, and one of the questions here is that apparently there was a lot, uh, there were a number of airport identification badges missing, perhaps uh, as many as 800 over the last year. Investigators want to know what happened to these, who used them, and if that played any role into the uh, tragic occurrence that we saw yesterday. And Chris, there's that one intriguing report as well that when two of the men who are believed to have been part of this hijacking gang arrived at Logan uh, Airport. They got into an argument with someone in the parking lot, and that man later called authorities when he heard two of the planes had been hijacked. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I sure do, Tom, and it's interesting because it seems like any time we get involved in one of these terrorist investigations, one of the key uh, elements of the investigation here is a vehicle. We've seen it over and over again. And again, that's what uh, uh, got investigators going here. Uh, there was a guy who got in a scuffle with two men whom he simply described as being uh, of Arabic uh, background. He got on the plane, didn't think anything more of it. He got to his destination. And like all of us yesterday, he looked up at the television monitor and said, oh, my God. And he heard that, that these plans came from Boston. Uh, he called authorities here and said, Look, I got into it with these guys. This is the car. This is where it parked. They went there. That's where they found these uh, uh, flight manuals in Arabic. Uh, they traced that car to, to these two men and, uh, you know, were able to pretty much uh, figure out that they were key players in this uh, terrorist attack. All right. Uh, Chris Hansen at uh, Logan Airport in Washington for us. Let's go back to Pete Williams now, our Justice Department correspondent. Pete. Well, Tom, a couple of things. First of all, just to follow up on what Chris Hansen said, federal law enforcement officials say the discovery of that car, the follow-up on evidence that was in it, they say, quote, looks very promising. So obviously, that is the biggest break so far in this case. They also tell us, uh, and this may seem obvious at this point, but it just has to be said, that what is happening at that hotel in Boston is definitely related to the terrorism investigation. So, so it's certainly that that we're watching. Now, in terms of why they're there, officials uh, uh, caution us that they're going to be they're do going to be doing this a lot in the in the coming days, serving what are called material witness warrants, which are used when you have reason to want to hold someone for questioning. You don't want them to flee. You have reason to believe that they have information that would be useful to investigators, but you don't have evidence that they were involved in the crime. That they tell us is what we're going to be seeing a lot of in the next few days, as indeed we saw right before the millennium uh, last time when there were reports of terrorism plots all over the U.S., these material witnesses warrants being served by the dozens around the U.S., and I'm sure we'll be seeing that in the next few days, Tom. 
All right, Pete Williams will let you go back to working on the phones at the Justice Department and your law enforcement contacts as this investigation goes on. There have been uh, some, I think, f fair to say, fair to say that there have been some uh, ugly incidents uh, d developing around this country uh, directed at Arab Americans. Mosques have been defaced. Uh, in line, we're told that uh, online chat rooms now have uh, condemned all Arabs. Uh, we have to be, uh, we have to remind everyone that there are more than seven million Arab Americans in this country of Islamic faith, and they are not terrorists. These are people of strong faith who are law-abiding American citizens, and in fact, in the Middle East, in many of those Arab nations uh, that we have been talking about, there are moderate leaders, including King Abdullah today of Jordan, who condemned this attack and condemned the small celebrations that took place on the West Bank yesterday. I'm joined now by former Secretary of State James Baker, Mr. Baker, we are talking about the place of moderate Arabs uh, in American life, not just those who live here, but those in the, uh, in the Middle East as well. You're very familiar with that part of the world. That's going to be a tricky piece for America in the coming days. Yes, it is, Tom. I uh, think it's always important to remember when we talk about <clears throat> Islamic fundamentalism that there are an awful lot of uh, fundamentalist Muslims who are very, very good friends of the United States, uh, many of them uh, American citizens, but also citizens of other friendly countries like Saudi Arabia and Jordan and the Gulf countries and other countries. So when we condemn uh, fundamentalists, we really should make it clear we're talking only about radical Islamic fundamentalists. Uh, you have served in the White House as uh, Secretary of State and as Treasury Secretary during times of great crises when it, as it now appears, this death toll begins to go very, very high, uh, no question there will be a real sense of rage in this country. That, too, will require some very skillful political leadership across party lines in Washington and across America. I think that, the, I think that, the, that all Americans are really going to unite behind the president. We've already seen that. There's not going to be any any political partisanship uh, at, a, at a time like this. And I really believe that uh, that there's going to be great sentiment on the part of, of the large majority of the American people to to uh, to hit back and to do so as effectively as possible. And in that regard, Tom, I might say that when when the first President Bush decided he was going to eject Iraq from Kuwait, we were successful in bringing the international community together behind that effort. We had we had Arab states indeed that were members of the international coalition. Most Arab states today, even some that sponsor had in the past have sponsored state terrorism, have condemned this action and expressed uh, a, a sense of condolence. Uh, and I really hope and believe that we will give some thought to building a, a, an international coalition to deal with this problem because this was more than an assault on America. This was an assault on freedom-loving peoples everywhere, and, uh, and it is something that, uh, that I think we might be successful in, in building a coalition to defeat, first through economic and political sanctions, then perhaps through military means once we've pinpointed responsibility. What is the instrument for doing that? Does the United States lead that with its NATO partners and other partners as no, they pick them up? No, I think that the instrument for doing that, as it was in the Gulf War, would be, uh, would be the United States' uh, superior uh, military technology and ability. Uh, it's not going to be easy. You, 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 you don't want to just blow holes in the desert. Uh, you know, that's been one of the frustrations in the past dealing with terrorists. When, when U.S. Uh, citizens were taken hostage in Lebanon and we were in office, we, uh, we, ne we, we never had many good choices because, yes, we could hit them with, with uh, missiles or, or air, air strikes and that sort of thing. But by the time you do that, uh, the terrorism, the terrorist action has taken place, the terrorists have fled, and you're just blowing holes in the desert. That's not a very good idea. I was very pleased to hear last night when President Bush said we're not only going to hold responsible the people who actually did this and organized it. We're going to hold responsible those countries and peoples who harbor those those people. And to my way of thinking, it wouldn't be a bad idea to, if, if, if indeed it turns out that Osama bin Laden was behind this, it wouldn't be a bad idea, in my view, to pick up the phone and call Kabul and say, okay, we want him, we want him in 48 hours, we want him in a week or whatever time period you put on it that was successful we we set a deadline in the gulf war it worked i would think we might want to give some consideration to doing the same thing today 
All right. Thank you very much, Secretary of uh, former Secretary of State James Baker, who has been a wise counsel to a number of presidents with a very uh, thoughtful and at the same time provocative suggestion that uh, we simply pick up the phone, call Kabul and say we want Osama bin Laden if he is identified as the ringleader and mastermind behind all this in 48 hours or else because as the president warned any country that harbored these terrorists would suffer punishment as well. One of our staffers at CNBC in Singapore dialed the foreign ministry in Kabul not so long ago, uh, just today and was told by a spokesperson there, yes, Osama bin Laden is in Afghanistan. That spokesperson saying, I have seen him. When and where, we, we cannot say, of course. NBC, NBC's Rahema Ellis is in uh, lower Manhattan, as she was all day yesterday and at Ground Zero last night. Rahema, the news does not get much better from there. No, Tom, indeed it does not, but the hope continues here. I'm in an area right now, and from this point down, the effort here is focused on recovery and saving lives. Ironically, some of the rescuers have been in need of being rescued themselves. Hundreds of them, we are told, may firefighters fear that hundreds of their own may be trapped inside the tangled debris because those firefighters were in the area when some parts of the World Trade Center came crashing down. And in the midst of what seems like and looks like an impossible task, there have been reasons to hope. Two Port Authority workers were pulled from the rubble last night alive. And early this morning, five firefighters were pulled from the debris and one was conscious. We don't know the conditions of those men at this hour. Hundreds of firefighters are literally working around the clock. I've been here all night long and watched them as they came through the area. Listen to what one firefighter, for, firefighter from Staten Island told me about why he is here. Thank you. Did you want to come? Oh, of course, everybody does. Just to help. Civilians in there, volunteers, a lot of people helping. Everybody's doing their part. We're going to need everybody because it's going to take a long time. They are literally working around the clock. And I said to some of these rescue workers, how is it that you keep going? They said they are fatigued, but they are running on adrenaline. I also asked them, how can you prepare for something like this? One firefighter said to me, there's no way to prepare for it. You just come to this area and do the best that you can. Again, literally hundreds of firefighters from as far away as Rhode Island and across to Pennsylvania and everywhere in between have come here with a commitment to see this task through to the end. Although as many of them have said to me, they have no idea, Tom, as to when they'll be going home. All right, Rahima Ellis in uh, lower Manhattan where the search and rescue effort continues, people volunteering. They're having a hard time getting a lot of those firemen and emergency rescue workers, in fact, to go off shift to get some rest and to get some food and to come back at another time. Uh, this will be going on not just for the next 24 hours, but for the next several days. Uh, we're joined now by General Norman Schwarzkopf, who was the commander of the Allied Forces in Operation Desert Storm. We just heard your old colleague, uh, James Baker, the former Secretary of State, say that what we ought to do, if it is in fact Osama bin Laden, is pick up the phone, call Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan, say to the Taliban officials, we want him in 48 hours or else. I think that's a good idea. Not a bad idea if we know he's there. That's a secret. We've got to know he's there before we can do something like that. What I thought was very important, what Jim Baker said, though, was about our other friends in the area. I've got to tell you that I knew Prince Abdullah very, very well, and I consider him a very good friend of our country. I, I, I worked with the Pakistanis a great deal uh, during the time of the Afghan resistance against the Soviet Union. And, and I will tell you, I have some very, very dear friends in the United Arab Emirate, beginning with Sheikh Zayed and his son, Prince Mohammed, who are truly good friends of ours. So we have to be very careful that we just don't condemn every Arab or condemn everyone who practices Islam. That's really an important thing. General Schwarzkopf, I think a lot of Americans are puzzled why they don't hear more support from the United States from, for example, Kuwait, which was liberated by the United States, or from our friends in Saudi Arabia which had its fanny saved by the United States during Operation Desert Storm, or from some of the other moderate Arab states that in fact have relied on American military aid and economic aid for that matter, uh, principally including Egypt. Well, many, many of those countries are, are very, are on very shaky legs. Uh, uh, they are walking that tightrope between uh, 
supporting Islam, supporting their religion, which of course they will always do. We've got to remember the king of Saudi Arabia calls himself the keeper of the two holy mosques of Mecca and Medina. He doesn't call himself the king. Uh, and, and, and also the fact that many of these countries have indirectly financed the, all of the operations against Israel. Uh, even when they are violently pro-American, they are also violently anti-Israel. And they have to be very careful and walk this tight line uh, because there are elements, such as Islamabad bin Laden, who has announced that he, all of these regimes are corrupt and he wants to overthrow all of them. It's, it's, it's not a cut and dried black and white world over there. It's very, very murky. We, want, we don't want to get into the blame game during uh, this time of a national crisis, but were you surprised when the new Bush administration didn't get more directly involved in what was going on in the Middle East as the escalation of violence played out on television screens here and in the streets of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and the other West Bank villages uh, in that part of the world? Yeah, I, I'm really not qualified to answer that, Tom, because I, I can't tell... I can't give you exactly how much they were involved and how much they weren't involved. There's no question about the fact that, that the United States is going to have to play a major role if we're ever going to see peace in the Middle East between the Arabs and the Israelis. On the other hand, it, there's no cut and dried, simple answer. Uh, as you know, it's, it's a very, very, very tedious uh, business that at any time, you know, can, uh, the plate can fall off the table. All right, thank you very much, General Norman Schwarzkopf, who's been with us uh, during the past uh, 24 hours and will be with us throughout the rest of this day as well. Baseball, Major League Baseball, has postponed for the third straight day. That's the first time that two complete days in a row have been postponed in the Major League Baseball schedule since World War I in 1918. Uh, this obviously will have an effect on the season as well, but this country is on hold, uh, understandably, until we can figure out uh, how many people can be saved in lower Manhattan, how many people have been killed there, what the political and military response to all of this will be, and certainly what the situation is at the Pentagon. This is a wounded nation, and it's still in the process of healing all other uh, business in this country, uh, both uh, retail, commercial business, the business of leisure and entertainment, all have been put on hold as people focus on their own lives and uh, grieve with the families who have loved ones trapped in the rubble that you see before you there. Let's go to NBC's Robert Hager now, who's keeping track of the aviation situation for us. Robert, there was some talk about lifting the ban on takeoffs at noon today, but that's been delayed some, I gather. It has, and all the major airlines, well, most of them are now saying that they won't fly until after 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time at the first. So that includes United Airlines, Delta, U.S. Air, Alaska. Uh, they won't fly until after 6 p.m. Pacific Time. Uh, Continental has said uh, it will fly only minimally uh, today, even tonight. Minimally, meaning probably just those flights that were suspended uh, yesterday in, uh, where passengers were in mid-flight at some connection connecting point and they go on and take them to the to the destination Northwest has said that it won't fly at all today Southwest has said that it won't fly at all today either my hunch is that some of these airlines that have said they'd try after 6 p.m. that in the end they won't fly uh, even this evening TWA says it's grounded indefinitely Midway which already was in financial trouble flying under chapter 11 uh, essentially went out of business today. They said they're going to close down more or less permanently uh, because they fear that passengers will be afraid to fly from now on and that all the airlines will take an economic hit. We can uh, tell you something about restrictions at the airport, some of this new security that people have been talking about. Uh, planes, planes carrying mail, so they're the principal carrier of mail in this country. They're not going to be allowed to take mail in passenger planes for at least another 48 hours is what we understand now. So the post office is going to have to weigh in with uh, more mail trucks for the time being. Uh, there will be increased screening, as we've heard, of passengers uh, and uh, carry-on luggage in particular. There'll be no curb curbside baggage. Uh, sale of knife-like objects is now being banned at airports and I think one version I heard of this is even plastic knives at airport concessions are being banned and if you can believe it knives were not part of the absolutely don't allow through screening list before well now they are no knives or knife like objects are going to be permitted through screening that means that passengers will not be able to carry them on airliners from now on Tom 
much, NBC's Robert Hager. That has always been, I thought, an uneven part of airport security, Bob. Uh, I have in one of my kit bags a Swiss Army knife, as a lot of people do. Sometimes it goes through, sometimes it does not. Uh, when I'm in Europe or traveling in the Middle East, it always gets picked up and it's handed off to one of the flight attendants and I get it back at the end of the flight. But in this country, uh, it just really does depend on the airport. But as you say, there will be a big crackdown on all of that. Tell me, if you're, if you're with the, me. Yes, go ahead. I, I had a thought about the, uh, in the, on the investigative side, on the cockpit voice recorders, because we said previously that, that that should provide important clues as to what went on in the cockpit. But there are two possibilities there, one being that uh, if these people were sophisticated enough to fly the plane, if they didn't want to leave a footprint of who they were, uh, that's a fairly easy off switch there to hit the cockpit recorder uh, button and, and turn it off. People have done that before. It came up with Silk Air in Indonesia, where the pilot, we believe, committed suicide, and he made sure to cut off the cockpit re voice recorder before he did it. Uh, one other thing, I'm not sure if they find a cockpit voice recorder, that we'll hear about it immediately. When the NTSB finds one in a normal case, uh, they, they tell us about it right away. But this, this is all under the jurisdiction of FBI and criminal agencies at this point. And if they find the cockpit voice recorder, uh, that would be a valuable find and a valuable potential piece of evidence if it wasn't turned off. And I'm not sure they'd tell us right away. All right, thank you very much, uh, NBC's Robert Hager. The search for the... Uh cockpit voice recorder and the rubble of the Twin Trade Towers at the World Trade Center here in New York is going to be a critical part of that search and rescue effort. They're trying to find people who may be alive, first of all, trying to recover the dead. But uh, Robert Bazell and others who have been down there say it's just stunning to see how small the pieces of debris are when you realize that these were two 110-story buildings that completely collapsed in what amounted to a junk pile of concrete, steel, glass, and electrical circuitry. Let's go to NBC's George Lewis now, who is in Los Angeles at uh, Los Angeles International Airport. That was the destination of three of the four flights that were hijacked yesterday. It's a ghost town today, George. Yeah, Tom, it is a ghost town. There are not, there's nothing taking off or landing here. There are maintenance trucks going up and down. It looks like some of the aircraft here, some of the 178 aircraft that are on the ground here are being maintained, perhaps in preparation for eventually resuming normal operations. But the people here at LAX uh, tell us they don't know when things will get back to normal. Uh, as Bob Hager reported, there are going to be all sorts of new security restrictions. The people here at LAX uh, confirm that the, it may be a situation where people are not permitted to check bags at the curbside. There may be new parking restrictions. You may see canine units, dogs sniffing uh, luggage throughout the airport, uh, all sorts of police presence that wasn't there before. So uh, as you said, all of the flights, all of the hijacked flights were headed for California. So all of the horrendous events back east have enormous implications here. Shocked and grieving, the relatives of the airline passengers were quickly escorted to a private area at LA International and later to two nearby hotels. Among the passengers bound for Los Angeles, David Angel, the producer of the TV series Frasier, and lawyer and TV commentator Barbara Olson, wife of U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson. Before her plane crashed into the Pentagon, Olson reportedly called her husband twice on a mobile phone to tell him the jetliner was being hijacked by men with knives, that the crew and all the passengers were being forced to the back of the aircraft. On United Airlines 93, the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania, Tom Burnett, vice president of a medical devices company in Northern California, called his wife and indicated he and other passengers were trying to overcome the hijackers. Father Frank Colachico, a friend of the family. Yeah, he called on the cell phone and said, told her that one of the passengers was already dead and that they knew that they were all gonna die and that, um, Two other men and he were going to try to do something, the conversation, and love you, honey. And that was the end of the conversation. On the same plane, Mark Bingham called his mother and his aunt. He just said, I want to let you all know that I love you very, very much in case I don't see you again. I said that. That the plane has been taken over by hijackers. And, um, and then I said, well, we love you very much too, Mark. Let me go get your mother. I hope it was quick. 
I hope he took an active part in thwarting the hijackers. Last night in Los Angeles, friends of two other hijacking victims attended a special church service, turning to their faith to ease the pain of the loss. Fa family members who uh, uh, are related to the people who were on the three L.A. bound planes have been taken to two hotels near the airport, one operated by American Airlines, the other uh, for the United Airlines people. Uh, they're meeting with airline personnel and grief counselors at this hour, hoping to hear any details of their loved ones. Tom? Thank you very much, uh, NBC George Lewis at Los Angeles International Airport. That intriguing report that there was a cell phone call made from one of the passengers on board the plane that they were going to try to take action against the hijackers. Uh, that may have caused that plane to crash outside of Pittsburgh. It was turned around and headed for the eastern seaboard. We can only presume that it was headed back toward Washington, D.C., the plane that had taken off from Dulles crashed into the Pentagon, you'll recall. The flight, this one was from Newark to San Francisco, uh, got out over Pennsylvania before it made a very sharp U-turn in the sky, but then it went down before it could reach uh, the nation's capital. Uh, grief counselors have been working with the families of the people who were on board uh, th those four airliners. Obviously, yesterday, grief counselors are at work. Therapists are being called to hospitals here in Manhattan. And then thousands of people who were in the vicinity yesterday are having to deal with their grief on their own. One of them is Clifton Cloud, who was in the immediate vicinity of the World Trade Center when the airplane struck and when the Twin Towers came down, and he joins us now. Mr. Cloud, why don't you briefly recap for us what you, where you were and what you saw. I was on the uh, roof of a parking garage right in my neighborhood on Essex Street, and I saw the, the gaping hole in the first tower and I ran home to get my video camera because I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. And when I was videotaping the, uh, the building, all of a sudden I saw this massive explosion and this white flash of light, which the camera didn't pick up. Uh, seconds later, I felt the blast uh, and just instantly realized how many people were involved and, and uh, the, the, human, the human face on, on the tragedy of that building going down. It was... Um, much more than I expected to see yesterday. Did you have friends who worked in, in either of those buildings? We, yes, the com company I work for, uh, Ace, we have uh, a lot of clients, uh, Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter. You know, I've been in that building. I've, I've climbed in the ceilings. We, we have crews in there all the time. As a matter of fact, I called our company right away because I knew we probably had people on, our way, on their way to that building or in the building to get them on the radio, to tell them to get out because this was obviously more than just an accident of an airplane that everyone thought at first. And uh, I, I tried to call them, I called my wife, and uh, it, it was shocking. It was uh, a real tragedy. And uh, when you're in that building and you know how high the floors are and you see helicopters flying around and you realize that those flames were 10 and 20 stories high and deep into the building, you know that, uh, that there was tremendous loss of life and a lot of wonderful, good people. And Mr. Claude, as you and I continue to talk, I'm going to ask our control room to find that remarkable piece of New York City Fire Department videotape and run it in slow motion. That was the first airplane that went into uh, the World Trade Center uh, Tower Number 1. And as they get that prepared, let me just ask you about what kind of a night you had last night. Last night, uh, my, my wife and uh, my son, we brought his crib into our bedroom. Uh, we honestly didn't know what to expect. Uh, we, you know, when you live in New York, uh, especially in the last six years or so, you, you see people committed. I saw firemen running with their gear to try to get downtown, and I felt like we were in good hands, but there was no telling what would happen. So my son and my wife and I, we all slept in the same room. Uh, we brought his crib in, and this morning when I woke up, I, I was glad that that everything was still okay. And, uh, and I th personally thank, you know, all of the people that are down there, uh, you know, that are working to, for all of us, you know, for all of our benefits. Maybe you can uh, share with the rest of the country the uh, spirit of New York. It's got a tough guy reputation, but a pretty tender heart, doesn't it? You know, uh, New York, uh, you, if you live in New York, you know, there's, there's, there's struggles, daily struggles, but everyone that lives here loves the city. I just flew back from Arkansas and uh, whenever I fly, I always get a window seat because if there's a chance of me seeing the skyline, I want to see it every time. And there was actually a gentleman in the aisle seat next to me who kind of 
said, excuse me, could I see the view also? And he was another New Yorker. Mm -hmm. No matter how long you live here, you, you love that skyline. You love, you, you love the icon of the, of the World Trade Center. Um, but also you deeply know inside that, that that icon represents people. It represents some of the hardest working people who've climbed up, that have taken, uh, they've taken their hits. They've, they've worked hard to get here. They commute, they work, whether they're cleaning the building or, or, or making incredible large decisions you know, involving many people. They work hard at what they do and they care deeply about what they do. And uh, you know, New York City has been home from everyone from George Washington to Al Sharpton. And I think that you know, we're, our diversity is what makes us strong. And there's, nobody is going to, uh, to knock us out. And I thought also when I saw the, the pictures of the people jumping out of the building, you know, maybe, maybe 20 terrorists uh, died. Maybe 20 terrorists committed suicide into the buildings. But a lot more New Yorkers jumped rather than be burned alive. Uh, because, you know, New Yorkers are always, and as Americans, I believe, are always doing what they can. Mr. Cloud, thank you very much for being with us and uh, give your child a hug for us as well. And we hope that your life gets back to normal before too long. Thank you very much. Uh, Clifton Cloud, who was in the vicinity of the World Trade Center yesterday with his home video camera when all that carnage occurred. And it is a great tribute to the city that it does pull together so often uh, during times like this. It is a city that represents the entire world. Every ethnicity, every faith, uh, every uh, region in this country, every small town in this country is represented in some small way in New York City. But in a time of a crisis, it is just one city working in one direction. And the New York City uh, public officials who are always on the griddle here, uh, held to the fire by the tabloids and by the various constituencies, they too have been doing heroic work at the state and at the city level. I think that it's uh, worth saying. We want to tell you as well that uh, this is the latest situation as we have it. As the president said today, we are at war. That's the word he used with terrorists. The FBI in Boston uh, have identified a terrorist cell. We think there may have been an arrest there. The FBI is requesting warrants for what they call material witnesses. Pete Williams, our Justice Department correspondent, says they're fanning out across the country and they're arresting people who refuse to cooperate or answer questions from them. Eight people were pulled alive from the World Trade Center last night, and at the Pentagon now they have revised downward, gratefully, the death toll. They were saying yesterday it could be as high as 800. Now just over 100 people were killed. All aircraft training at Huffman Aviation, and then went on to take larger aircraft training somewhere else. George Stephanopoulos tells us something's happening downtown. George? Peter, yes, we've just heard that, that there is a bomb scare on the corner of Harrison and Greenwich Street. It's a rolling suitcase, which the police identified in the middle of the block, and they're in the process of clearing it now, or at least several minutes ago, they were in the process of clearing it. You know, we don't want to go too far and talk about every single incident that happens, but this is a credible report, and the police are in the process of clearing it right now. Thanks very much, Second, George. Peter. Sorry, go ahead. I also spoke just a few minutes ago with two firefighters who told me that the list now of firefighter casualties, the one that is up in the fire stations that they came from, is now above 340 casualties um, from, the, from the New York Fire Department. I'm sorry, George. Someone interrupted me just as you gave me the figure. Would you give it to us again? The list is over 340, according to these two fire department officials. Thank you very much, George. I appreciate it. George Stephanopoulos, uh, as close to the, uh, uh, to the Trade Tower zone as you can get at the moment. Firefighters, uh, the New York Fire Department now saying, at least according to Georgia's sources, 340 firemen have uh, unaccounted for at this point. Um, come back to the bomb scare. John Miller. What you've been seeing uh, since, the, uh, since the explosions and the crashes at the World Trade Center is a, a long series of those. It started yesterday immediately as people got jittery about any package they saw on the street, anything they didn't recognize. And in fact, they were encouraged to report anything suspicious. So what you've had is a series of NYPD bomb squad units out of an abundance of caution running from place to place, checking these packages out. They use a portable x-ray and a bomb-sniffing dog, uh, looking for the dog to react. 
Uh, then they use the x-ray. If it uh, looks clean to them, they do a hand entry. If it doesn't, they go the whole route with the robots. But this is uh, something that uh, has unfolded dozens of times since yesterday. Uh, this morning there was an explosion at Lincoln Hospital, which caused a great stir until everybody arrived on the scene and found out it was a generator with a backflash. But again, because of the events that have occurred, uh, nerves are high and people are checking everything. And there are and there are always troublemakers. I'm all, we never get over the fact that in the, in the worst circumstances, there's always somebody willing to cause more trouble. But many more of these are, um, are objects that were inadvertently placed somewhere, left somewhere, than the malicious call to police. Um, it's, just, it's just people acting uh, very cautiously. Okay, John, thanks. A couple of other small pieces of information uh, to report at the moment. Uh, we've learned that both America Online and Earthlink uh, two of the nation's major internet service providers have been served with something called a surveillance order by the FBI. The FBI is apparently looking for internet connections and email traffic uh, connected to those two sites, which millions of people use. And both companies want to be quoted as saying, we are cooperating fully with the authorities. And when asked what details authorities are looking for, spokesman declined to be very specific. But we do know that two of the big uh, internet service providers uh, have been sought out by the FBI in terms of finding information and baseball has now organized baseball major league baseball has now postponed all of its Thursday games which would account for the third straight day that the schedule is going to be wiped out Ron Claiborne is on the phone from Boston so what's happening in the Westin Hotel Ron well Peter I am outside of the Westin Copley Plaza a 35-story hotel in shopping complex which has been evacuated and the crowd which is gathered outside is being pushed back further and further from that uh, hotel the bomb squad or a bomb squad vehicle is in front along with two ambulances and the police here are not uh, saying anything but in talking to uh, a number of people in the crowd they say they saw what appeared to be a, an individual being hustled by a large number of heavily armed uh, police officers into a vehicle and driven away. Several other people said they have seen a uh, civilian taken away on a stretcher about 45 minutes ago. One person I spoke to, with the caveat, of course, that this person is not among the authorities, says he heard two police officers speaking among each other, saying that they had uh, taken into custody one suspect and that, in the words of this person, the other one was dead or wounded. And he added that uh, one of them had driven a cab for 15 years. That is, uh, that is an important uh, remark, if that is indeed true, because we know that the authorities were looking uh, into the Boston Cab Company, where two former associates of, of Osama bin Laden had worked uh, in previous years. One of those people uh, was subsequently uh, killed, and the other is now in jail. Okay, thanks very much, Ron Claiborne in Boston, who will bring us up to date. In terms of these cab drivers, we assume that these are alleged uh, associates of Osama bin Laden, and, the, and Ron Claiborne quick to point out there that these are overheard conversations involving one man dead and another man wounded being removed from the Weston Hotel in the, in the Copley Plaza. Um, I just keep a, a break on all of the things that keep coming in from uh, from other places. No reflection on reporters. We just have to remind ourselves all the time that we are talking about, in, in, in very many cases, second-hand and third-hand information. Try to tell you when it is. And when we get our traditional two or possibly three sources, then we're a good deal more confident uh, of the information that we have. Cynthia McFadden is at one of the hospitals now, and I know you've been talking to the doctors, Cynthia. I have, Peter. Um, Dr. Andrew Feldman is one of the few doctors who has actually been at Ground Zero, one of the few to come back out and brief the press. He is an orthopedic surgeon. He tells me it is Beirut. He says there are military in the area. He says he saw no survivors in his several hours there. He says he is doubtful uh, that the rescue attempts can result in any kind of massive, effective rescue at this point. Uh, he went down hopeful and came back with very little hope, Peter. Um, we will be able to talk to Dr. Feldman a little bit later. He'll make himself available to us. So we'll, we'll be able to uh, tell you more about this. Let me tell you a little bit, Peter, if I, if I might. 
uh, about some of the other issues. Um, we've talked to some of the doctors who have been treating the rescuers, and they say that many of the rescuers have injuries to their hands and knuckles. These injuries sustained as they tried with their bare hands to dig out victims in the rubble. Uh, they say one of the major issues uh, at this point, besides, of course, just trying to get through the rubble, is the quality of the air downtown. There is an extreme dust problem. Uh, the dust problem is severe. Um, Dr. Feldman is standing uh, by here. Uh, Dr. Feldman, is it possible we're live? At the, could, could we speak to him for one moment? Yeah, yeah take him right now. Then okay, right Dr. Okay. Feldman. Um, How are you? Dr. Feldman, can you uh, relate a little about what you saw? Uh, well, it's like a war zone. I mean, it really is. I think it's it's much worse than, than you could see on a television camera. Uh, the amount of damage to the collateral buildings is no, monumental and... Uh, but I'm, I'm very, very happy that there's such an organized effort and the people who are the rescue workers there are incredibly calm and efficient. But uh, nonetheless, this is a horrible devastation. There was really nothing for you to do medically? Well, we, we were trying, but there weren't a lot of people they were pulling out. And the people they were pulling out, uh, you know, were not doing well. So uh, you, descri you described it to me as Beirut earlier. Try to set the scene for those of us who haven't seen it. Well, firstly, there's dust everywhere. There's a lot of asbestos. It's difficult to breathe, uh, breathe even with a mask. Um, there's, uh, if you can see by my boots over here, yeah. there's probably six, down? seven, eight inches Dr. of Dr. soot, uh, you know, soot on the ground and, uh, all the buildings are covered, uh, with dirt. Um, and as you get closer to the scene, uh, obviously there's more devastation in terms of the gnarled buildings and, uh, and the, uh, you know, we saw, uh, cars that were blown out. I saw several fire trucks that looked like they were twisted in half and, uh, clothing, papers from the buildings. Uh, it's, it's kind of a very odd scene when you're picking up a Merrill Lynch paper and reading what the guy had on his desk that morning and, and there it is burnt on the ground that afternoon. It's, it's very tough. Having talked to the rescue workers down there, what, what are the opportunities at this point for rescue, do you believe? Well, I mean, we're always hopeful, obviously, and everybody down there is trying their best to, to do what they can do. But the sheer magnitude of the uh, of the burnout in the buildings, uh, I, I don't have a lot of hope. I'm, we'll do our best. At this point, can you tell us, uh, I mean, the fact that we have empty stretchers here at all the hospitals in town, it's not an optimistic. Well, you can use your own judgment on that one. I mean, if, if there were people coming out, they'd be coming here and pretty slow at this point. Dr. Feldman, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. So, Peter, much. that's the situation yeah, down here. Yeah, I very Back appreciate it. That's a very discouraging report, of course, from Dr. Feldman, who's been at the site that said, he said, and we all knew this was the case. It was worse than you see on television. It's been a lot. We'll ask Cynthia if she can still hear me to continue to, uh, to try to pursue this, this notion. A lot of damage to collateral buildings. Um, he says it's hard to breathe with a mask. Not a lot of people being pulled out. These are the really most discouraging uh, uh, remarks we have heard in, in, in some time. And, um, and he said something else about the degree of burnout in the buildings, and there is not a lot of hope. I, I think, Cynthia, if you could try to put together that for the, in the next couple of minutes, we'll come back to you, because that's the most dispiriting report I think we've heard from the scene itself. But I want to go right now to John Miller, who um, has been following this Boston incident at the Weston Hotel very carefully. What do you know, John? Um, if we can bring those pictures back, it might be helpful. Okay. Uh, this was the FBI uh, terrorist task force made up of a FBI agents, Massachusetts State Police officers, working the Logan Airport leads from this, bo uh, from this uh, terrorist case. A paper trail led them from the Logan Airport to the Weston Hotel, where they believe one individual had rented two rooms. They were very interested in looking at those rooms to discern if they could get evidence there. That would be rooms 1403 and 1404, both on the 14th floor. The FBI agents and Massachusetts State Police arrived. They got hotel security to get the keys for both rooms. As they made their approach on the 14th floor to the two rooms, suddenly three individuals came out of one of the rooms. The agents backed off, um, let the people go by them, and at the elevators they took them down. At that point they say... Uh, you, you don't mean took them down the elevator, by the way. No, I mean uh, took them down as, uh, as in felony arrest right. style, put them down on the ground, exactly. um, placed them in custody, two females, one male, um, and uh, they began screaming in Arabic, according to uh, people on the scene. 
So uh, at that point, uh, they hustled them out. Then they wanted to look in those rooms. Uh, hotel security opened the rooms. Uh, the agents uh, walked in and, uh, and uh, asked for um, the, uh, the Boston police, well, the Boston police SWAT team arrived. Right. Um, because now that the agents uh, had these people uh, screaming in Arabic and they weren't able to understand what they were saying, they were worried that people may, might still be in those rooms. So they called for Boston SWAT. Boston SWAT arrives and uses fiber optic tools to look under the door and the rooms appear to be open. So they do a simultaneous tactical entry, booming both doors and going in to find that the rooms are empty. Uh, then the Boston bomb squad dog goes in and alerts on two items uh, in one of the 14th floor rooms. A waste paper basket and a large uh, suitcase. Uh, the bomb squad then tries to x-ray the suitcase, take a picture. Uh, we had just talked about this moments before. Exactly. Uh, to see if there were discernible shapes inside and they couldn't really get an image that was satisfying. That's why you see the shift in the scene here from a large crowd in front of the hotel to no one in front of the hotel and everybody moved back a block. Uh, the bomb squad said, evacuate the hotel, evacuate the block, and uh, we're gonna decide what to do with this suitcase. They have their options from training. Uh, they can use an interrupter device, like a water cannon, essentially to blast the suitcase with such force that it will short circuit a detonator and render it safe. Or they can do either a robotic, using a robot, or a hand entry. Um, the other two are much more preferable, and I think they probably have the room to do that. So what you're seeing here is going to drag on for a while. Now, uh, that update is very helpful. We had Ron Claiborne on the phone uh, from Boston just a moment ago, referring to one man dead and another man possibly wounded removed from the building, or one person dead or wounded. Do you confirm that in any way, shape, or form? I, uh, I, could, I could probably tell you that's not true, although um, that was the rumor going around in the crowd because the one male was hustled out. Um, and there were witnesses who saw that and then there was a rumor I guess because mm. people had been put down on the ground that someone was hurt um, we can say fairly authoritatively now that's not so okay thank you very much uh, we are we are we are anxious when we overhear conversations in crowds because as Brian Ross who is with us at the moment and has been working this investigation in a very broad way understands that is about the easiest way to get yourself in trouble Absolutely. over over here a conversation <laughs> right. in a crowd but on the other hand it sometimes provides very good information right. what have you got Brian? well here is some information that is quite hard the uh, discovery of the car last night in the boston airport uh, led uh, fbi agents to a man they have told us was one of the terrorist hijackers an egyptian national by the name of mohammed atta who apparently was on the ins watch right. list it was Mr. Atta who spent the summer of 2000 in Venice, Florida with another man learning how to fly at uh, the Huffman Aviation Service in Venice. Right, that we've just and, been talking about. Yes, and Mr. Deckers was on the, on the line there talking with you. Uh, it was Mr. Atta and another man. Uh, Atta and this other man briefly stayed with Mr. Decker's accountant, uh, right. Charles Voss. And uh, Mr. Voss says uh, he threw him out of the house because he didn't like the way he treated uh, his wife. Right. Uh, as well, Boston continues to be a focus of, uh, of the activity yesterday. The police chief in uh, Portland, Maine, has told us that five men came across the border in uh, Jackman, Maine. Uh, they all tried to board a commuter flight out of uh, Bangor, but there was only room for uh, three of them. Uh, the two others went on to uh, Portland. Uh, they reportedly boarded a U.S. air commuter at 5.53 yesterday morning to make the connection in Boston. We're not clear whether it was the connection to the American flight oh, or yeah. the United flight, but it's clear that uh, they came in from Canada just before uh, this flight. I don't know where, where precisely where Jackman, Maine is, but this is up on the border mm -hmm. of, it could be New Brunswick, uh, up on the Canadian border, which is uh, just a, a part of the of the world that simply doesn't have, to the best of my knowledge, very much good surveillance on it, does it? No, they, they can come across and people go back and forth quite easily there. Yeah. What else you've got, Ryan? Th that is the latest. Uh, the, the information in Ottawa, though, is uh, the first solid indication of uh, what FBI authorities have told uh, ABC News is, is definitely one of the uh, terrorist hijackers mm -hmm. who apparently was... Uh, at least a year ago, learning how to fly right. at a small airfield in uh, Venice, Florida. And, do we, and just a one last question for both of you. Do we now believe that in terms of the immediate investigation, the former CIA director James Woolsey pointed out this is not the important investigation if these are the guys who are dead, but that we're talking about 12 people on the four different aircraft 
in some in a configuration we don't yet know, but we're talking about 12 individuals about whom they now have some knowledge. They have some pretty solid leads, uh, in large part because of the, the information in, in Portland and then this uh, dispute uh, that some of them had yesterday at the parking garage in uh, Boston. And the man with whom they had a dispute right. later called the state police and that led them to this car, which led them to Mr. Atta. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot for police work, but it's sort of like the, uh, the traffic stop. This was a, an argument in a parking right. garage that gave them a significant lead. Many it thanks. Them, uh, Let me just interrupt you for sure. one second, because Lisa Stark, who's in Seattle, has some news about, uh, about the state of aviation at the moment, and I have a feeling it's not going to be very encouraging either. Lisa? No, I'm afraid it's not, Peter. Transportation Secretary Norm Mineta has just announced that the only planes that will fly today are those that were diverted yesterday to places other than their intended destination. Those planes apparently will be allowed to fly and return to the airports they were supposed to go to. We don't know how many flights that is. Uh, the FAA could not tell us. We believe about 120 international flights put down in Canada. We don't know how many flights domestically went to airports where they were not supposed to go. Uh, we understand also that the ground stop uh, then will be extended for all other flights, uh, except, as we say, these that were diverted. Uh, Secretary Mineta also announced some of the security checks that will be required at the airport, uh, including uh, security checks of all the planes and airports before passengers are allowed to get on. As we've said, no curbside check-in, passengers only allowed beyond the boarding area, and vehicles near the terminals will be monitored very closely. Peter? Thanks very much, uh, uh, Lisa. And, and, and there are a lot of aircraft which were diverted on their way to their destinations elsewhere in the United States yesterday. And a lot of them are indeed at airports in Canada. Some of them are international flights which are coming to the United States. And we will try, for those of you expecting someone from somewhere, to get as quickly as we can the number of planes, a considerable number of aircraft on a lot of airports all the way from eastern Canada um, to western Canada, and some which were ordered by the FAA to land at the nearest airport to them in the United States. <coughs> Excuse me, we'll try to get that sorted out, but we're talking about a lot of aircraft, but the Secretary of Transportation says those are the only ones that are going to be flying today. Everything else, as we've suggested, with Atlanta and Boston to continue to be closed down. To Bill Blakemore in Lower Manhattan. Bill. Uh, Peter, there's a couple of new wrinkles here. First, a uh, shift in the wind just a few minutes ago is giving all of midtown Manhattan now a taste of what the firefighters, the rescue workers are up against. An enormous cloud, even up on the 40th floor above the uh, rescue operations control center. We can uh, taste it and feel it. It's gritty and in our eyes, and the Empire State Building is now almost completely um, blocked out because of this great cloud of dust and smoke moving uptown. Secondly, the building that we're standing on has, uh, the building we're standing on has now been locked down. There's a suspicious object down on the corner and uh, the police have moved everybody back a good um, hundred yards from that suspicious object. They're not letting crews leave the building either. Thank you very much, Bill. And I want to go now to Cynthia McFadden, who has just recently been talking to one of the doctors who's been closest to the scene, who I think can fill out that report. Uh, she gave us a moment ago. Cynthia? Yes, Peter, I can tell you a little bit more. Uh, we had the opportunity to talk in detail with Dr. Andrew Feldman, who is an orthopedic surgeon here at St. Vincent's Hospital. Earlier in the day, they asked a team of doctors to go into the actual ground zero location. Right. Uh, He's the man you've just been to talking to, to on television, right? That's right. What he said was this, Peter. Two to three buildings are still on fire that he saw. Twenty buildings affected that he counted. He could reach no one was, who was alive, nor could any other m medical personnel that he contacted. He said that he saw numerous Humvees driving around with men, uh, soldiers, with machine guns patrolling all of the streets that they transversed. He said that uh, they drove uh, for blocks and blocks. The financial district uh, essentially ruined. Uh, the report very, very dire from Dr. Feldman. Uh, Dr. Feldman uh, hopes to go back downtown. He says there are still medical personnel in the area, but the heartbreak, he says, is that there seems to be nothing for the medical personnel to do, at least at this point. Now, Cynthia, I want to understand this clearly. Nothing for the medical personal personnel to do in the immediate area of the trade towers or in a wider area? 
Uh, he says that from the time they entered the area, and he describes it as a, essentially a 10-block area, uh, they saw no one who they could aid. Uh, he says that though they are making valiant efforts at evacuation, at trying to dig through this rubble and to get to, to people who are presumably trapped, that no one was rescued at the time that he was down there, which was the last several hours, and that he was able to talk to no other physicians, no other EMTs who were able to get to anyone. Thanks very much, Cynthia McFadden, uh, having talked to Stephen Feldman. It, it, it is indeed uh, about as discouraging news as we've heard so far, and it may, in fairness, not be definitive. We've talked to one doctor who's made a tour of, uh, uh, of what he describes as a 10-block area. Um, we caution ourselves that in circumstances like this, there are often in earthquake situations people buried beneath the rubble who indeed may have survived. The mayor of New York has made that has made that case uh, several times. So is ABC's Bill Blakemore, who's covered uh, so many situations similar, but not like this before. But uh, Dr. Feldman's remarked that they are not reaching the living, and he has not managed to talk to anyone who disagrees with him in that 10-mile area. And this constant stream of pictures giving us a greater sense of clarity as every hour goes by. That's very touching. I'm not quite sure what he's going to do with that American flag, but maybe we just follow him as far as we can for a second. We noticed on the Pentagon early this morning that in the particular part of the Pentagon which had been attacked, uh, the rescue and research workers, it's up there on the upper right-hand side above over that gash. Someone had raised an American flag. I don't know whether we saw it last night or tonight. We're joined now by Dr. Stephen Warner, who is the... Dr. Peggy Pardon, my notes say differently. Dr. Stephen Garner, who is the chief medical officer at St. Vincent's Hospital, and St. Vincent's is a hospital um, that just uh, just has has gone flat out since the very beginning of this. Am I right? It's Dr. Garner. Yes, Dr. Steve Garner. Hi, Hi. Dr. Garner, and thank you for taking the time. Um, we haven't had a chance to talk to you before, so would you mind very much just going from the beginning? You heard the blast. Yeah, we actually were in a, a room discussing what we thought were, you know, at the time, very serious matters, financial matters. And as the discussion ensued, we heard a droning engine very close, almost like a helicopter that was maybe a few feet overhead. And then the next thing we heard was screams, uh, people running in the street screaming, help. Uh, the executive team ran outside on 7th Avenue and looked. We saw a gaping hole in the uh, trade tower and uh, immediately the uh, triage disaster plan went into effect. Um, would, you remind, would you mind explaining to people again, lest they forget precisely what triage means? Yes. Uh, triage is an approach to a large-scale disaster in which we attempt to save the most number of patients. So for example, those mortally wounded, those who have little likelihood of resuscitation would be given the lowest priority. We, we go after patients who we feel that with medical treatment we can stabilize and save. So we triage them either the, the minor injuries, the cuts, the scrapes and so on, the uh, heart attack, people that we think we can help with stabilization and those that are just basically beyond uh, we feel uh, those who we can help. And, and, and based on those who you're trying to help in every regard, how bad is it when you come face to face with it? It's the most frustrating uh, process that, you, you know, you wish you're trained to help people that are hurt, to help people and, and not to give up, not to play God, that, that anybody can be saved. And yet you have to walk away from people who, who are living. And um, you just have to, you can't think too much of the process. I think the whole idea of a disaster plan and a triage system is to take the emotions out of the process. Mm -hmm. It's a very key component of, of, of getting your job done, right? Yes, you cannot. And you think about it a few days afterwards, and that's, that's the time when mm -hmm. the, the shock sets in. And how many people have been through your facility in the last 26, 27 hours? We have eight facilities throughout the city, and we've had about 600 uh, patients. Um, unfortunately, many of the patients have been the, the low, um, the, the cuts, the scrapes, the burns. Um, the patients that we could really help that we've admitted have not made up the majority of that list. Uh, we've admitted about 50 patients, and we've seen some horrific things, and actually, the great majority seem to be tied to mental anguish associated with this type of tragedy. We had a cameraman yesterday who witnessed the event and had an MI, a heart attack. We had another person who had a, an aortic aneurysm 
that was precipitated by hypertension, high blood pressure from the episode. We had a woman who walked all the way from the site to Queens. It's about um, probably a 20 mile walk into Mary Immaculate yeah. Hospital. Had no idea how she got there, walked in just in a daze um, with abrasions. And the soot, the, the one common denominator, everybody comes in with this thick white soot, which um, we have to de decontaminate the patients. One of the, the first things we do is to wash the patient down and to, to wash the eyes, to wash the face, and to clear the nasal passages. We have heard many references to people suffering either minor or very serious burns. Have you had a lot of burn patients and have you got the capacity to treat them? We, we send the serious burn patients and we've had about eight of them, people who have third degree burns occupying most of their body to the Cornell Burn Center. Um, each person has to know how they can help best in these situations. I know many of our administrators that wanted to help and they realize that you have to allow the process to go through. There is a plan in effect and the plan runs smoothly when it's allowed to run. And um, we at St. Vincent's know that when a person is seriously burned, that there are facilities within the city that can handle these patients um, in, in a more effective fashion. That's why we send those seriously ill patients. And, and you may have been too, as you said uh, yourself, sort of locked down into doing the immediate job at hand, but you have a sense that, uh, that the city and the hospital system in the city has been able to handle everything that's been thrown at it? They have been able to handle, and the amount of volunteer, the number of volunteers have, have been incredible. The ambulances that, that have shown up, the and ambulances of all faiths. We have the Hutzeller ambulances, which is the um, the very orthodox group that runs an ambulance, coming right down with bringing a hundred nurses and volunteering um, ambulances. I think in in one respect, well, we didn't we don't know the full magnitude how our system would be able to handle the full magnitude had thousands of, of unaccounted for patients been in the category that we could have helped. Um, that's something that's scary and something that I think we have to address as we go forward, as, as we see new types of situations that we never dealt with before. H how does the city merge all of its uh, resources into one collective uh, approach to a disaster like this? Dr. Garner, um, you heard Dr. Andrew Feldman, uh, I think you may have heard him just before we come on saying, it's worse than you see on television. I think we all know that to be the case, but is that particularly true in your case? It is worse. Um, you, there's a smell in the air of burnt flesh, a, a smell of death that um, everybody talks about. And the people that have gone home, it, it's hard to wash it out. It just, it leaves this memory of, of the, you see people um, with arms severed, with uh, a, a chest Totally, um, you can't recognize it because of blunt injury to the chest and they've developed collapsed lungs. Uh, and then the emotion, when you add that, you know, we have a center of 500, um, we have a center right now at, we set up at the new school for patients uh, and also for families who want to find out about loved ones. Mm -hmm. And the scene at that center is just horrific. Uh, they give the name, we look, we can't find the name mm -hmm. on the list, and they, they walk aimlessly in the street, they don't know where to go, and they come back, what should we do? Dr. Garner, Dr. Garner, in just about one minute, I'm gonna have to leave you because the Secretary of State is gonna show up and say something. I just have one last question. As you see what you have seen, do you concur with Dr. Feldman that the news is gonna get worse, not better? Unfortunately, um, the news will get worse. Mm -hmm. We're very grateful for you for taking the time to uh, talk to uh, us about this. Dr. Stephen Garner, the Chief Medical Officer at St. Vincent's Hospital in New York, um, giving us another uh, slice of what life is like uh, much closer to the scene. And you can feel the tension, I think, in Dr. Garner and the depression in Dr. Garner at what he has seen. Clearly a man who has never, as so many people um, in New York, and outside Washington, never seen this thing before, never encountered a disaster of this magnitude. So now the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, uh, who has already on the record, as is the President today, saying the United States is involved in a war, is going to speak and perhaps answer questions on what the status is of the United States vis-a-vis -vis its international relationships. He may have something to say about the investigation um, we simply do not know. He's going to speak at the State Department. Can I just go to the State Department room, give me some hint of when he's exactly. Uh, there's the reporters gathered at the State Department, including ABC's Martha Raditz. Uh, Mr. Powell has, has came back from Columbia yesterday, a man who, um, who's been a part of the Bush team from the very beginning, but uh, about whom there have been any number of questions in the last uh, week or two or longer.
as to what uh, role he was really playing on the Bush team and what kind of a man Colin Powell really was. Now we're going to give get some examples. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I thought what I would do is to update you on the activities of the last several hours since uh, I spoke to uh, the press this morning. Let me begin once again by saying that our hearts go out to all the victims and to their families. It is a tragedy, but as the president has made clear, it is a tragedy that we are strong enough to overcome. Our spirits will not be broken. The resilience of this society will not be broken. We will find out who is responsible for this, and they will pay for it. We are undertaking a full court press diplomatically, politically, militarily. And in the course of the morning and early afternoon, I have been in touch with a number of foreign leaders and international organizational leaders to coordinate the diplomatic approach to this. I have talked to Kofi Annan, Secretary General of the United Nations, and I thank the United Nations for the Security Council resolution they passed and also for the statement from the General Assembly, and I expect the General Assembly to also work on a resolution later today. Lord Robertson in NATO is hard at work with resolution that is under consideration now that would tee up, if I can put it that way, prime Article 5 responsibilities. Article 5 of the Charter says that an attack from aboard, abroad by any uh, one against any member of the alliance is an attack against the alliance. Um, if that resolution goes forward, that doesn't invoke Article 5 yet, but it puts in a position to be invoked when the United States makes a judgment about the nature of the attack and where that attack came from. And I appreciate what Lord Robertson and his colleagues are doing for us. I've also been in touch with Foreign Minister of Belgium, Louis Michel, who is also head of the presidency of the EU at this time, and High Representative Javier Solana to thank them for the strong support we have received from the European Union and the statements they have made and their cooperation uh, promised to us to deal with this tragedy and to move forward. I've also attended uh, along, of course, with my other colleagues, a National Security Council meeting with the President where we reviewed all that has happened and began to make our plans for the efforts we will be taking in the future, not only to bring these perpetrators to not only justice, but to the punishment they deserve, um, but at the same time to undertake a worldwide effort to build a coalition against all forms of terrorism, wherever it may occur and however it rears its ugly head. This will be a major priority of the administration, and I can assure you it will therefore be a major priority of the State Department. I have also, uh, in the course of the day, spoken to the Foreign Minister of Great Britain, Germany, Canada. I have uh, spoken to Foreign Minister Perez twice, Prime Minister Sharon, Chairman Arafat, and Foreign Minister Manley of Canada, if I didn't mention that, Foreign Minister Ivanov of Russia, Foreign Minister Ruggiero of Italy, and I have another number of other calls that are, are in the process of being made so that we can bring all of this together. And I must say I am deeply touched by the expressions of support I have received from my colleagues. And as I think you all know, the President has been very busy, and I'm sure the White House has announced his two phone calls to President Putin, as well as to Mr. Chirac, Jean Jimin, President Jean Jimin, Prime Minister Blair, Chancellor Schroeder, and Prime Minister Kray Shen. So he's spoken to all five members, other four members of the Security Council, permanent members of the Security Council. And uh, I will leave it to my other cabinet colleagues to talk about the issues under their purview over defense, justice, and FBI. There are, of course, lots of reports and rumors out there, and I think it is wise for all of us to take many of these reports and rumors into some context and perspective. This is also a time, of course, in that regard, for the American people to try in this time of tragedy to restore the society to a sense of normalcy. We've got to get back to our jobs. We've got to get back to work. 
And I know that uh, Secretary Mineta, as soon as it is possible and as soon as it makes sense and is safe, will restore the air traffic system and uh, commercial air traffic will be brought back online and I will wait for him to make those announcements with respect to that and I know that's very much on your mind. Once again, we're building a strong coalition to go after these perpetrators, but more broadly, to go after terrorism wherever we find it in the world. It's a scourge not only against the United States, but against civilization, and it must be brought to an end. I will be delighted to take a few questions. The State Department has been advocating restraint in response to terrorism with the argument that uh, violence only provokes more violence. It's an endless cycle. I wondered if uh, the U.S. will be guided by its own admonition now that the U.S. has been horribly attacked by terrorists. I think when you are attacked by a terrorist and you know who the terrorist is and you can fingerprint back to the cause of the terror, you should respond. But the Andrew? I, I mean, should it be a limited response or... You should respond, whether it's limited or other than limited. You should respond to those who did it, and uh, if you were able to stop terrorist attacks, you should stop terrorist attacks. Andrea? Secretary Powell, one country you didn't mention uh, was Pakistan, and I understand that your deputy yes. has spoken with the ambassador to Pakistan and that this evening the U.S. ambassador to Pakistan will be meeting with General Musharraf. What specific steps are you asking Pakistan to take, and have you at all insinuated that if all signs do lead to bin Laden, that the U.S. would take military action against Pakistan and Afghanistan? Our ambassador is uh, going to be seeing... Uh, uh, going to be having that meeting that you made reference to. It'll probably not be this evening, more likely uh, tomorrow as a result of schedule problems. But Ambassador Armitage, Deputy Secretary Armitage, did meet with Pakistani officials today and really to share views. We have not made a determination yet as to who is responsible for yesterday's attack. But we thought as we gather information and as we look at possible sources of... Uh, the attack. It would be useful to point out to the Pakistani leadership at every level that we are looking for and expecting their fullest cooperation and their help and support as we uh, conduct this investigation and as we generate more information and see if they can be helpful in generating information as well as uh, how helpful they might be uh, if we find a basis to act upon that information. So yes, we are doing what you described with the Pakistanis. Robin? Um, just to clarify, when you say you're building a strong coalition to go after the perpetrators, uh, does this mean that you are expecting or hoping that other countries will participate in some kind of military retaliation? Under Article 5, if we go that far and it actually is executed, then there is an obligation on the part of our, of our NATO allies to uh, assist if we go in this direction. It doesn't mean that they necessarily will participate in the attack, but uh, it makes it uh, easier to obtain support in the way of uh, overflight rights and things of that nature. Uh, so we're not, we're, but I don't want to get into uh, what we might or might not do and who might go with us and who might not go with us because that's, that's just too speculative at the moment. Can I follow that? Um, having been through the Gulf War as you were, uh, would you hope to build a kind of coalition that extends perhaps beyond NATO and, and includes perhaps Muslim nations, nations? Uh, from yes, different parts it, it, of the world. It should include uh, uh, Muslim nations. Muslim uh, nations have just as much to fear from terrorism that uh, strikes at uh, strikes at innocent civilians. And uh, I do have a number of calls, and I just haven't connected yet with uh, uh, other leaders uh, uh, in the world representing uh, Muslim populations. Uh, as I was coming down, I was waiting to receive a call from Amma Musa, head of the Arab League, and I'll also be talking to my Egyptian colleagues and Jordanian colleagues before the evening is out. Mr. Yes, sir. You have not yet mentioned the point that President Bush made last night, the idea of holding other countries responsible. Yeah. Uh, this seems to be a dramatic escalation in the U.S. view on how it responds to terrorism. Is that a correct interpretation of it? And, and as a follow-up, you talk about returning to normal, yet there have been all these mentions of acts of war the idea that the country is, is in a war. Uh, how can we just return to normal when uh, in, in a situation like this? Well, on, on, your, on your first point, uh, I mentioned in my earlier uh, statements, and I will mention it again, that 
it's not just a matter of going after the perpetrators, but it's going after and dealing with the sources of support that they have, whether that source of support might come from a host country or other organizations that provide them. We have to make sure that we go after terrorism and get... I'm gonna, we wouldn't break away from the Secretary of State unless there was important so news to report. ABC's Terry Moran is at the White House, and the President's spokesman, Terry, has just gone on the record um, to ABC News, believing what? That the plane which crashed into the Pentagon was intended, intending to go somewhere else? Well, Peter, it is a remarkable on-the-record statement from White House officials, uh, White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer, saying, quote, we have reason to believe the plane that hit the Pentagon, and that was uh, United Airlines 93 from bound uh, for San Francisco from uh, Newark, we have reason to believe that the plane that hit the Pentagon, its original target was the White House, according to Ari Fleischer, and that Air Force One was also a target. Now, if you recall uh, yesterday's flight that the president took from Florida to Louisiana to Nebraska and back that Ann Compton was on, you recall those very dramatic pictures mm. of uh, the plane Air Force One being accompanied by fighter jets. Apparently, they had credible information that Air Force One was also a target. But the information we're being given now that the investigation has developed, according to the White House, the White House itself was targeted. Thank you very much, Terry. We'll come back to this in fuller detail, but at, at the, I want to go back to the State Department briefing, and maybe I can get a word. Let's have a look at the State Department briefing room then, please. Uh, let's go back and see if, see if we can get a word into Martha Raddatz's ear, who is our correspondent at the State Department, to see if she can ask. Uh, if we've got anybody in that briefing at the moment, can we get them to ask the second? If anybody's inside, I repeat, working for ABC News, can they raise this question with the secretary? We'll listen to him for a moment. saying that Osman bin Laden have uh, his training camps in Pakistan and because he's sending all his, uh, running his empire or terrorism empire from Pakistan. So now, is it time now to go after those countries who are harboring terrorism really? Because how long can we wait or how long, how many innocent people can we kill? Well, I don't want to confirm what the Indian government may or may not have said. Um, but as the president said last night, we will be directing our efforts not only against terrorists, but against those who do harbor and do provide haven and do provide support for terrorism. Jane? Um, Secret Deputy Secretary Armitage uh, heads a task force with the Russians on Afghanistan, where the United States and Russia seem to share some interests. Can this be used as a platform in the coming days? Or yes, we're planning to do that. In what way? Um, as you know, we're, it's a little difficult to travel right now, but we're looking at ways that uh, he and uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Trubnikov can pursue this. Yeah. With, a, with a country like Afghanistan, with whom we don't have diplomatic relations, um, it, 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 there's less leverage that we have against that country. Um, what kind of things are you thinking of using now when you talk about going after the entire country? Is it food aid? Um, how, how else we can haven't, you We haven't singled out any country to go after. What we're trying to do now is gather the evidence and the information so that we can make a judgment as to who is responsible for this act. And once we do that, we will go after that group and we will determine uh, what kinds of support they've been getting from what host countries or other uh, supporting agencies, and we will go uh, and deal with them as well. Mr. Secretary, there are some 25 organizations on the list of FTOs, the State Department's list. Should all those organizations uh, consider themselves uh, targets of this uh, global campaign against uh, terrorism? And secondly, when you speak to the Arab leaders, and uh, will you be asking uh, for specific acts of su support of, of material assistance in this campaign? On the uh, first question, just the very designation that they have been put on that list of foreign terrorist organizations suggest that the United States will be taking action against them, and we just identified another one this week, uh, the AUC in Colombia, and we take certain actions against them. It doesn't mean we go in and attack them with military force, but there are a variety of, of political and diplomatic and other uh, and legal actions that you can take against them. Um, with respect to conversations with our uh, leaders, um, I'm sure I will... Uh, discuss with them a full range of possibilities as to what kind of support they can give us of a political and diplomatic nature. I don't know of any other kind of support that I would uh, ask for at this time. I might mention that in the context of my discussions 
this morning with uh, Shimon Perez and uh, Chairman Arafat and also uh, Prime Minister Sharon, I encouraged all sides to do everything they can to get this process of meetings started that uh, uh, we have all been waiting for, for Mr. Arafat and Mr. Perez to find an opportunity in the very near future to meet and not have protracted discussions about where to meet. It's more important to meet. So in this time of tragedy, in this time of heightened tension throughout the world and especially throughout that region, let's seize this opportunity to see if we can not start... As we're listening to the Secretary of State, bear in mind what we have just reported, that Ari Fleischer, the President's spokesman, has, has told ABC News the following. We, the White House, have reason to believe that the plane that hit the Pentagon as an original target was not the original target, but the original target was in fact the White House. And we also have reason to believe that Air Force One was a target. As soon as the Secretary finishes, we'll explore this in greater depth. This current intifada. And secondly, do you believe that this bombing will somehow serve as a problem for moderate Arab governments whose peoples seem to be more enthusiastic about this bombing than their governments who have condemned it? The governments have condemned it. I think that uh, when it is realized throughout the region what a horrible act this truly was, I think it'll be sobering for the region. And I hope everybody will realize that no matter what you might think about the crisis in the Middle East, this is not the way to solve it. And this is not the way to express your views about that by killing hundreds and thousands of innocent civilians. I hope that is... I hope that is sobering to anybody who has uh, any civilized drop of blood flowing through their body and who believe in an almighty of some form or another. This is not the way you do it. There's no religion that would condone the kinds of action that we are seeing. And so I hope this will be a sobering experience for the world and especially for those uh, in the Middle East and in the uh, Persian Gulf. Yes, Steve. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, we know you have said that you don't know who's responsible, but your comments this morning um, on television and um, the president's comments about harboring terrorists do seem to indicate um, an organization such as Osama bin Laden and also about harboring terrorism point to Afghanistan as a, as a country that harbors terrorists. What did you make of the um, comments by the supreme leader of the Taliban yesterday um, about the attack, and do you think that um, that the Taliban are still harboring Osama bin Laden? And if um, he is deemed responsible for this attack, do you think that the Taliban will expel Osama bin Laden and help uh, the U.S. bring him to justice? I'm sure that uh, the Taliban leadership providing um, protection and, and opportunities and facilities for. Uh, Osama bin Laden, um, but I don't want to get into the hypotheticals as to whether or not he is responsible for it. A body of evidence is being developed and in due course uh, we'll make an announcement, but I don't think it's useful to say, well, we are 50 percent, 60 percent, 70 percent sure it's this organization or that. That just leads to very often incorrect answers, and I don't think it's helpful during this time. So as the evidence builds, and it is building, uh, in due course, we will make a judgment and we will act upon that judgment in the way the president has uh, indicated. The last one for Alan. Mr. Secretary. Alan. What conversations do you anticipate having with um, the leaders of Persian Gulf countries? What support will you be seeking from them if, in fact, it's found that the threat originated in their part of the world? And what kind of military uh, latitude would you like to be able to exercise in that part of the world with their blessing? If we think they can be helpful in finding those who may be responsible, we will expect that help. And we will express the point of view very, very clearly, and I've already started to do so in some of my preliminary conversations, and frankly, I expect support. They are outraged. They are shocked. They are stunned, whatever their views might be or whatever the views of their people might be with respect to the crisis in the Middle East. They are stunned and find this to be a deplorable act. I think they're speaking not just as leaders, but as leaders of people who, although some might rejoice and shout, most find this to be uh, deplorable and something to be condemned. 
And uh, going back to an earlier question, um, obviously the, the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis has been going on for a long time and is always in the back background. But some of the terrorist organizations that we have seen at work over the years uh, conduct terrorist activities against the United States, regardless of how the peace process may or may not be going uh, with respect to uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. Specific, Thank you very much. Sorry, Thank you. Specific conversations you anticipate having? Will you be talking with to who? the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, oh, yeah, the I've, Emiratis? I've already had some conversations with uh, uh, with uh, with Saudis, and I'll be I'll be doing more this afternoon. We're still. Uh, changing time zones as I catch up on my phone calls. Thank, Thank you. you. It was not the Pentagon. Ari Fleischer told our reporter at the White House that the the, the target was not Good. the Pentagon, but in fact the White House and that Air Force One was also a target. Ari said that? Yes. Have you heard that? Yes. Could you give us more detail about no. that, what you've heard, but the intent no, of No, I don't, I don't have anything House. to go beyond what Ari said, and uh, I really need to uh, yield that part of it to uh, intelligence and law enforcement agencies. Thank you. Well done, Martha Raddatz. ABC's Martha Raddatz got into the briefing at the last moment there and managed to ask the secretary whether he had indeed heard what Ari Fleischer told ABC News a short while ago, that they believe that the aircraft that attacked the Pentagon had as its original target the White House and also believe that Air Force One was going to be a target. Now, we do not know First of all, how they know that, and we'll try to pursue that along with my colleague John Miller here in just a moment, and also at the White House. But it, may, and we don't know when they know it, which is important in terms of the president's movements yesterday, because the president, you recall, who'd gone off to Florida on a trip about education yesterday, was then moved in a very erratic and secret fashion around the country. And Ann Compton, who was with the president all day, and may be able to talk to us again this afternoon, uh, told us in, in very dramatic fashion, you may recall, yesterday afternoon, I think we actually still have the video of it, as they were on their final leg of their journey, uh, coming back from the Strategic Air Command Base in Nebraska to Washington. Uh, they were able to look out their windows and see F-15s and F-16s, and as I said, I think we can actually see that on a piece of video right now. They had F-15s and F-16s as a jet fighter escort for Air Force One, and that was the first time she could remember that in many, many, many years. We'll come back to the Colin Powell briefing because there's quite a lot revealed in here, not least of which is the difficulty. Mr. Co Mr. Powell's talked to an awful lot of people today, but he's not been able to talk yet to General Musharraf, who is the military leader slash dictator in Pakistan, and uh, Pakistan's right next door to Afghanistan, raises a lot of questions. But in the meantime, um, with this important news in retrospect. Let's go to Terry Moran at the White House. Terry, do we know any? Do we know how they know this? Not at the moment, Peter, although we're expecting a briefing from Ari Fleischer shortly. <clears throat> what I can add is this. Uh, yesterday, as I was coming into the White House, uh, and we have pictures of this, uh, people were essentially fleeing the grounds. And I talked to some of the White House staffers who said they were absolutely stunned. The White House has been evacuated before in President Bush's term when there was a car here parked on the driveway that uh, was considered suspicious by one of the bomb sniffing dogs and the evacuation proceeded in a very orderly fashion. They like to do it that way. It communicates that they are not afraid of these kinds of things. One of the things the White House staffers told me was that they were originally told, please exit the building in an orderly manner. And then an agent came in very suddenly and said, no, just get out, just run. And that's what they did. And, and, and remind me, I, I don't remember precisely what time that was yesterday, but the walk and then suddenly run may make a little more sense now. Do you remember what time precisely that was? That would have been a little bit before 9.30. I would say between 9.15 and 9.30 when the building was evacuated. So that was after the uh, planes had hit in uh, New York and just about the time, I guess, that they were hitting, that the plane hit the Pentagon. Okay, uh, Terry, anything else you want to add at the moment? Well, all I can say is that uh, Colin Powell is obviously singing from the same page as the president and everyone else in this administration. The real question here is, can they conceive a response that both satisfies their 
parameters of specifying the people who are, who are responsible, and yet is commensurate, is big enough, nasty enough to meet the emotional demands of the American people in the Congress. Precisely. Thanks very much, Terry Moran. And now let's go back to the State Department where ABC's Martha Raddatz managed to get in and ask that key question. Well, not the key question, but a very important question for the moment. Um, and we heard what you got out of him. Did, did other people mutter other things as you left? No one muttered anything, Peter. They, weren't, they didn't want to say much beyond what Ari Fleischer said. But one of the things I would say is that this all makes sense. Hitting the Pentagon where the terrorists hit the Pentagon, they caused the least amount of damage in terms of a statement. You had these very precise, sophisticated strikes in New York hitting right at the heart of the Twin Towers. And yet at the Pentagon, you hit a side that was being renovated. Probably the least loss of life on that side didn't hit the side where the Joint Chiefs are, didn't hit the side where the Secretary of Defense is. And that actually struck me yesterday that in the terrorists' mm. planning, that might have been a flaw. Well, I take your point, and just to be argumentative uh, with, for just for academic sake at the moment, in fact, by hitting the Pentagon, um, <clears throat> the terrorists announced to the world that they were able to penetrate the very heart of the military establishment in the United States. And even we didn't know until quite late in the day that this was a part of the Pentagon, which in fact had recently gone through renovations. And in fact, the injury list is less than we anticipated it might be. I, I wouldn't argue with you there, Peter. It certainly made a statement mm. by striking the, the building. That's obvious. But it's, it's very easy to find out where the Secretary of Defense is in that building. They're on the riverside. Everyone knows that. There's a parade field right next to it. It is a very prominent place in the Pentagon. And if someone really wanted to make a bigger statement, it seems that's where they would try to hit. Okay, Martha, I'm going to come back and talk, if we may, about Colin Powell and the country's dilemma in terms of the rest of the world in just a minute. But first to Capitol Hill and Linda Douglas. Linda, uh, congressmen and senators have had briefings on the current situation. What do, what do they learn? And you subsequently from that. Well, it's actually the House members who've just come out of their briefing with various uh, intelligence officials and cabinet officials. And the headline of what they've been told is that they shouldn't have a false sense of confidence. These attacks may not be over. They were told we don't know what, when, or where, but this may not be over. That was very worrisome to the congressman I talked to. They were also told that, they, uh, that the intelligence mm. officials feel that they're 90 percent certain that Osama bin Laden was involved in this, but not the only one, that there were other financiers of this operation in addition to Osama bin Laden. They also told them that they believe that the uh, Taliban government is supporting Osama bin Laden and they said they have very good leads uh, to some of the people that we've been hearing about all day long who are connected with Osama bin Laden. A uh, final point, Peter, uh, they were also told that uh, some of the people who may be arrested, who they believe have ties to Osama bin Laden, might be arrested on charges other than those connections such as immigration violations. But they're, uh, they're going out around the country looking for those people. Let me just ask a couple of fairly simple questions. Who briefed the congressman? Well, the briefers were, I was told by some of the congressmen uh, that there were CIA people in this briefing, uh, as well as uh, the chairman uh, of the Transportation Committee, uh, the, the uh, Transportation Department, uh, Norman Netta, uh, Tommy Thompson of uh, Health and Human Services, the director of the FBI, Mr. Mueller, and the Attorney General, John mm -hmm. Ashcroft. Okay. And let's just put some things in context for the audience. We have known for some time that the Taliban government uh, in Afghanistan has been giving protection to Osama bin Laden for some long period of time. We also know that the leader of the Taliban uh, did his best today in a statement to a Pakistani newspaper, as did Mr. bin Laden, to try to place some distance between his regime, his government in the capital Kabul and Mr. Bin Laden say they had no idea what he was doing and he operates as an independent. But the, the, the Taliban has been under tremendous pressure before uh, to cooperate with the United States uh, either in expelling Bin Laden from Afghanistan, which is very difficult to penetrate and thus make him more vulnerable to, uh, to international authorities. And on this question of whether it may or may not, may not be over, Linda, can I ask you to, to maybe put some meat on, on, on those bones if it's at all possible because I have no idea what 
any briefer might mean at the moment. It's such a general statement. I, I tried as hard as I could to get meat. It just wasn't given to them, Peter. Uh, I, I asked, for mm. example, other forms of attack. Uh, what are we talking about? Uh, biological mm. warfare, other places. And both, uh, this is a Democrat and Republican I just got off the phone with, both said they were simply told we don't know what, when, or mm. where, but you shouldn't have a false sense of confidence. This may not be over. And do you think they were, they were making a reference to the current spate of operations that we've seen in the last day or to the general notion that people are interested in attacking the United States? They were making reference to the current operations uh, that we've seen over the last day or so. There's a, there's a sense of nervousness uh, that there could be another shoe to drop. They would not uh, tell them whether they have any hard information to lead them mm. to make those, uh, to, to raise those concerns, uh, but that was the concern that they raised. Okay, well I know you and, and, and you on our behalf will want to go back to your sources and see if you can pin them down any further on that because that's, uh, that's quite an astonishing, who does? Because there is, uh, that's quite an astonishing statement to put out, uh, John Miller, to the American public. I want to come to that in a minute. But we're joined by um, Congressman Chris Cox, who I think is in Washington at the moment. Congressman Cox, uh, what do you think about that other sort of flat statement being laid on the table, this may not be over? Have you picked up the same thing from briefers? Well, of course, uh, uh, there was a leadership, congressional leadership, bicameral and bipartisan uh, briefing at the White House this morning, a broader briefing for uh, some 400 people, uh, members of Congress and staff on the floor of the House today, and that is the one to which Linda Douglas just now was referring. Uh, I don't think that uh, it is the object of the United States government at this point, the President of the United States, uh, in his message last night, or uh, any of us uh, as we uh, speak publicly or indeed privately today to suggest that we have any information uh, about uh, a second wave of attack. That uh, was something that might be inferred from what we were just hearing, but I think, Peter, that you're right uh, to mm -hmm. say that the emphasis is on the fact that we are always going to be vulnerable to a new kind of terror and a new kind of surprise uh, rather than that there's uh, any uh, solid intelligence that something's about to happen. So as far as you're concerned, sir, everything you've heard today was not a sense of immediate alarm about which Americans should suddenly be more anxious than they already are. Uh, that's correct. Uh, most of our discussion today uh, has been focused upon uh, the aftermath. Uh, just learning the details, some of the grisly details of the uh, makeshift mortuaries that are being set up, the uh, FEMA operations, and as was just reported, the FEMA director was one of our briefers, uh, the body counts, uh, the efforts underway to rescue those still living uh, and move them from the rubble. Uh, Mr. Cox, uh, Secretary Powell just said a moment ago that uh, they didn't want to, he doesn't want to finger Osama bin Laden at this moment. And I think we agree there is something of a tendency and some evidence perhaps early on to support, to support the finger release going in his direction. He said we don't want to give it a 50, 40 or 50 or 60 percent chance that we're sure of this. Is that about where you think we are based on the intelligence briefings you have had? Well, we have had so much uh, immersion uh, in these horrible facts uh, over the last day and some uh, that uh, we tend to think that perhaps more chronological time has elapsed. In fact, it's been a very, very short period of time. We are overwhelmed uh, with uh, chores, uh, responsibilities uh, on the one hand and uh, sources of information on the other hand. We've got to sort it all out. I am, however, pleased at the rather rapid progress uh, that our intelligence community has seemingly made uh, in moving forward in their investigation. So what do you think you're getting in terms of information? What do you think personally, based on everything you've been told, as much as you're prepared to tell us, what do you think you've learned about who did this? Uh, well, there has been a great deal of public speculation, and I must, of course, confine myself to that, uh, and some of it more than speculation because it's based upon uh, reported fact uh, focused and you upon also know, Osama and you bin Laden. And you also, know, you also know, based on hearing the public information, and based what you've heard privately, you know how to sift it accurately for us too. So sift it in your answer. Uh, you remember in uh, August 1998, uh, the United States uh, uh, attempted to retaliate uh, because uh, Osama bin Laden was suspected then of uh, attacks upon uh, our embassies abroad. Uh, <clears throat> dealing with terrorism uh, inefficiently or incompletely, I think we are now finding out, uh, is going to keep America at even 
greater heightened risk. And so uh, what has happened in the last 24 hours is that the United States and indeed uh, the entire free world that is watching with us on television uh, is now uh, becoming annealed uh, in this crisis and I think uh, directed towards the necessity of finding precisely uh, the people involved in these terrorist networks uh, and rooting them out. D did you know before you heard it publicly from us that the uh, that the White House believed the White House itself might have been the primary target and not the Pentagon? Uh, I did in fact uh, hear this uh, before I arrived today, yes. And, and you heard it from officials in government? Uh, I, I'm not, uh, I heard it on uh, ABC certainly just as I was driving over here uh, and uh, I'm not certain uh, the degree to which uh, we know more than that. Yeah, and, and, and does this cause you any additional alarm? I mean, we're all alarmed to start with. Well, I, there are some, there are some uh, uh, plainly evident facts. Uh, very trained pilots uh, were involved in this hijacking. They took over these aircraft and they chose a very clear day. So obviously they could operate on visual and improvise. Can I have a short answer, if I may, to one last question? Uh, forgive me for putting it that way. Um, do you believe the Congress is going to stay the course? Um, the United States has, uh, is under tremendous, the administration is under tremendous pressure now from the public um, and from politicians to do something, find somebody and do something. If it takes time, if it is complicated, do you think the Congress will stay the course? I think that there is no question. Uh, if one is looking for silver linings, there are many. There are many acts of heroism, as we are beginning to learn. People react sometimes very valiantly in these horrible circumstances. Our political system and our government, I think, is also uh, becoming something of which uh, every American can be proud. It was a little bit, or it would have seemed to me in other circumstances, in any case, uh, uh, surprising, if not indeed corny, uh, to have uh, the entire United States Congress on the steps of the Capitol mm. uh, without uh, prompting a breakout in uh, a rendition of God Bless America, but it was that kind of a moment last night, and uh, I certainly happily joined in, and I think most Americans were mm. proud to see that their government is working together in this way. We will uh, stay the course. Uh, indeed, one of the questions is uh, whether or not we will have sufficient patience uh, to do the job right and, and not uh, just uh, lash out to, to try and show immediate results when uh, what's required this time is to do the job thoroughly. Many thanks, Congressman Cox, Republican Congressman of California. You also answered one additional question for me. I think many of us in the country were very moved by that rendition of God Bless America on the steps last night, but we were never absolutely sure until you told us now that it was without prompting. Thank you very much indeed. Bless indeed. Congressman Chris Cox, Republican of uh, California. Uh, and let us now return to Colin Powell just to do a quick retake on... You want to add anything to this story, John Miller? We've heard from the White House in terms of this change of targets. Does it make sense to you? Do you know how you figure this kind of thing out? Where might they have heard it? Actually, I'm confused that they believe um, that the plane that hit the Pentagon might have targeted the White House because there is the plane that went down in Pennsylvania um, that would have had a, an available target, a mystery target. Uh, certainly the White House, if you were a terrorist, would have been a nice target to complement the Pentagon. Um, and as, as uh, you've instructed us, we're going to go to work and try and find out uh, what the basis for that information is and, and how they know that. Okay, many thanks, John. Now let's go back to Colin Powell. Now, what is clear is that on behalf of the United States, <clears throat> and certainly of the administration, he's talked to just about everybody, with the notable exception uh, so far, maybe others will not note this exception, so obviously, um, of General Prezev Musharraf. Uh, who is the military dictator in Pakistan. And U.S. officials are in the process of talking to General Musharraf's uh, representatives, but there is and has been a deep connection with some elements in Pakistan, notably the security services and what goes on in Afghanistan. Um, and it has been the case since the United States and Pakistan were even more closely involved in the war to expel the Soviets from Afghanistan. Um, there's a very ugly history here of violence and changing or relationships between the United States and the other, the former superpower of the Soviet Union, um, and we don't quite know how to figure that one out. We're going to keep coming back to this, but the mayor of New York, Rudolf Giuliani, is going to give a news conference. Let's listen. Seeking mm. information about who was in the World Trade Center. Did they get out? Didn't they get out? Are we able to recover them? Aren't we able to recover them? And uh, we don't know the answers to all those questions yet. 
We so far have a um, body count of 55 people as of about a half hour ago. We, uh, we were able uh, to take out an, uh, another person about three hours ago, two, two three hours ago, a, a woman who was found uh, still alive, taken to the hospital. So now uh, there are at least four people that we've been able to take out. We're searching for others, and you know, we'll try to get more information, and we'll try to do the best that we can to identify as many people as possible. But I really think this is the situation we're going to be living with for, for, for a while, which is we'll only know uh, whether we've saved someone or recovered someone's body when that actually happens. But we'll try to get as much information as possible. We have the airline manifest now. They're being kept by the police department. But if people check with us, the police department and the FBI can check the manifest and, uh, and we can get the information for you about whether someone's on the airplane. Uh, we would urge people uh, to go back to normal as much as possible, to go to restaurants, go shopping, do things, show that you're not afraid and show confidence in, um, in yourself and in the city. We'd also urge people not to in any way take any action on their own. We've had a few, not many, but we've had a few incidents that appear to have been directed against uh, people because they may, they may be regarded as Arab or or, a, or a Asian or Indian or whatever. The police department has a few reports like that. I, I emphasize not many, and there, were, there was only one situation of uh, anybody trying to steal anything last night, so we haven't had looting, which we're gonna certainly do everything we can to stop. But uh, nobody should attack anyone else for racial, religious, ethnic reasons or any other reasons. That's, 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 that's what we're dealing with right now. We're dealing with the insane sick hatred of people for another group of people because they fit into some kind of group mentality. It would be really horrible if New Yorkers practiced any form of that. Mm. So the police department will be in those parts of the city and give the ultimate protection that we can give to people who may be, uh, may be in that situation. One other thing, uh, the generosity of uh, people is really enormous. We have thousands of volunteers we have people uh, volunteering to give blood. They're lined up on the street in front of Bellevue Hospital uh, and all of the rest of the city. Also, uh, some, of, uh, some of our corporate citizens have already made uh, major donations for the benefit of the families of the police officers, the firefighters, the EMS workers uh, who uh, will turn out to have lost their lives in this situation. GE. The uh, CEO of GE, Jeff Imholt, uh, told us that he is going to uh, donate uh, $10 million to a fund for the families of the, uh, of the police, fire, and other emergency workers that uh, tragically turn out to have lost their lives in this situation. The Cisco Corporation has also offered a donation of $4 million for similar purposes. And we will organize a... Uh, We'll organize a, a, a charitable organization that can be accountable and can make sure that uh, all of this money gets in the hands that, um, that it's intended to get to, meaning to the children and the families that turn out to be the, the most direct um, victims of, the, of, this, of this tragedy. And again, I thank GE and I thank Cisco and all the others who have come forward in their own way and helped us. Governor? Mayor, thank you. Let me join with you in uh, thanking Governor DeFrancisco for being here and for the extraordinary help we've gotten from New Jersey and the cooperation we've had with the Port Authority. It's been just tremendous. And we appreciate that help. And uh, the mayor referred to us as coming out of a one-hour briefing, but it's really not a briefing. It's a work session. And it's a work session where decisions are made uh, and steps taken to try to alleviate the suffering and do everything we can for those who might still be alive. And I want to commend the mayor. Uh, for his leadership uh, and for the leadership of his team in these meetings because it is extraordinary how well everyone works together and how serious everyone is in putting one agenda first and foremost and exclusively and that is the interest of the people of New York State. So Mayor, to you and your team, you deserve enormous credit for that leadership. Uh, it's not just the leadership, it's also the individual heroes who are out there and just uh, this afternoon I was at Bellevue visiting a uh, uh, fallen firefighter 
who had been hospitalized. And I went up and uh, congratulated him. And he got this smile on his face. And he looked at me, and it was like a line out of a movie. And he said in this thick accent, what'd you expect? I'm a New Yorker. Uh, that's the spirit uh, that is allowing us to get through this tragedy. Uh, and it's also the heart, because right after that, uh, he got tears in his eyes and talked about his partner in the fire department who was missing, who had 10 kids. And I told him we would stand with him, we would stand with his partner, the city, the state, the country, to make sure that their heroism was recognized and protected. Uh, we have to, in honor of them, get back to business, make sure the states and city and country runs and that people go about their lives. And, to that end, tomorrow afternoon, we are going to be holding a special extraordinary joint session of the state legislature in the state capitol, uh, where we'll be having uh, remarks and a memorial uh, for those who, a moment of silence for those who have lost their lives. And the legislature will be passing a bipartisan legislation uh, condemning this terrorist act uh, and, uh, and commending the tremendous heroism of those who have responded uh, as they have. Governor Pataki of New York, who has spoken uh, repeatedly about the spirit of New York and the spirit of the state, but particularly about the people in the city of New York, and, his, and who, along with Mayor Giuliani, has, uh, has uh, repeated how uh, important it was, not only for New Yorkers themselves, but for the rest of the country as a whole, that New York um, show itself as New York has a lovely story about going to visit someone in the hospital and said, would you think I was a New Yorker, uh, which is a nice story, and there's always the... The, always the use of that accent when people are telling the story. Um, Mayor Giuliani has, uh, you know, some, some, some bad news and some uh, moderately, uh, and some other news. Uh, he points out that uh, they've managed to get four people out today. They've counted uh, 55 people. <coughs> um, they're still searching for others. Uh, he points out that everybody's going to be still living with this situation for a while, and all the reports we've heard today have been very dispiriting about the, about the search and rescue operation. He says that you can find people who were on board the planes because the city now has the, has the airline manifest. We assume the airlines also are, um, are responsive to people getting in touch with them who have had friends or relatives on the aircraft. Um, Ju Mayor Giuliani almost every time has to talk about outright prejudice. As I walked through the empty streets of this city last night, I came upon a, a totally despondent uh, Egyptian in a delicatessen. Um, and I said, you know, why do you feel like you do other than for the obvious reason? He said, because I happen to come from Egypt. He said the obvious thing, there's no reason for you to feel like that. Not everybody is against you. But there is a strong feeling of vulnerability in, in the Arab community in many parts of the country today. Um, also true in, in the subcontinent community, Asians and Pakistanis, uh, who are feeling vulnerable in various parts of the country today outside. And, and by the way, this is also true in New York City about the Jewish community in some respects. Outside every synagogue in New York City last night, uh, there was a cop assigned sitting there, often a man on, you know, who's, who's taking care of traffic tickets and traffic during the day, but outside every synagogue, at least on the west side of Manhattan, there was a single top cop talking. So there are vulnerable people out there, and it's fallen to Mayor Giuliani more than anybody else, I think, to remind us that prejudice is just plain stupid, ugly, and ignorant. Um, these corporate grants, they'll, they'll begin to happen. Uh, General Electric, which ironically has been in a big fight with the state uh, and, and, and the federal government about cleaning up the Hudson River, has made a grant of $10 million, and Cisco is going to give $4 million um, to fund uh, for the families of those firefighters, police, and other emergency workers who have died um, in, in, in the struggle. And there are many. There are many. There's just simply no question about that. Um, we'll come back to the sort of international dilemma of the United States and well, but want to move it around. ABC's Charlie Gibson uh, has been here watching this all day, checking his sources, talking to people all every day. Charlie, give us a Give us an update. Well, Peter, just a couple of things that perhaps you haven't uh, seen. And I was struck that the mayor said he was urging people in New York uh, to get back to normal. And I want to show you some pictures that were shot just in the last couple of hours on the streets of New York because they are in the upper part of the city like you just don't see in New York. The streets are eerily quiet. The subways are back, the buses are back, except in lower New York, uh, which has been sealed off. But as you can tell, there's not much traffic moving. There's a few cars here and there, but no horns, no traffic jams, no packs of pedestrians. It is very light. 
Now, the bridges have been reopened in and out of New York. Uh, Amtrak is running into town. There's no Staten Island Ferry because that comes in uh, to the foot of New York. But as you can see, this is a sight that would just amaze most New Yorkers for a Wednesday afternoon. And yet that's the way it is. There are people walking around, but most folks simply staying home. A lot of New York businesses did not open today, told their workers to stay home. They did. Uh, I was struck uh, yesterday by a quote from uh, somebody who operates a chain of malls across the country that had closed yesterday. He said it was a day for people to stay home with their families, to be with their families, to hug their kids, and a lot of New Yorkers doing that uh, today. Now, that's the view from the streets of New York. What did New York look like yesterday from way up high? We've got some satellite uh, pictures to show you. These pictures were taken from the Midas camera and the Terra satellite from NASA, and you can see Manhattan Island snaking down there in the middle between Long Island and New Jersey, and you can see the cloud of smoke uh, from the fire from the World Trade Center going out over New York Harbor. Uh, right down, looks almost like an extension of the Hudson River there. That was what it looked like yesterday, just after the two World Trade Towers had collapsed. And then we have a little bit later here, uh, well, one more picture there that you can see the smoke going across, almost due south across New York Harbor. And then there's one more shot. This was shot by Frank Culbertson. Uh, this is one more still photograph, I'm sorry, but there is also some moving video shot by Frank Culbertson. He's the commander of the space shuttle uh, that yesterday was going over in New York. This was shot at a slightly different time. You'll see it in a minute. Uh, but this was shot at a slightly different time. Okay, I'm told it'll be up in just a sec. Yeah, there, here it is. This is moving video that was shot by the uh, space shuttle as it went over. And this is at a slightly different time of day when the wind had shifted uh, coming out from the northwest and the... Uh, smoke from the fire and from the collapsed buildings was blowing across Brooklyn. Uh, there, one of the boroughs of New York. Uh, just one other thing, Peter, uh, you received about an hour and a half, two hours ago, a call from a very distressed woman, and I apologize that I have forgotten her name. Uh, but she was looking for her husband, who worked for uh, Cantor Fitzgerald, uh, the firm that had offices in the 101st, 3rd, 4th, and 5th floors of the first tower and she was so distressed that she couldn't get uh, information uh, as to whether he might be in one of the hospitals in New Jersey. There are a number of websites and I've been looking at some of them and a lot of messages that have been posted. Uh, there's an AOL website and an enormous amount of traffic on that website of people uh, looking for relatives or actually in some cases people who are okay trying to find their relatives. There's another website on Prodigy uh, there's one that's been established by the University of California at Berkeley, I am told. So there are a number of message boards where people are trying to find one another and still have been unable to do so. And, and talking still about that same firm, Cantor Fitzgerald, uh, which is a firm that had offices in the top part of the first tower. There's a piece in the Wall Street Journal, and I was thinking about it when you were talking to that woman. There's a piece in the Wall Street Journal about the fact Cantor Fitzgerald has New York offices and Los Angeles offices. The Los Angeles office got a call through to the New York office after that plane had hit the first tower. And that phone call was then put on a speakerphone and broadcast throughout the offices of Cantor Fitzgerald out in Los Angeles. And as they were in communication with the New York office, uh, people in the New York office were saying, I think a plane just hit us. Uh, the phone call continued to be broadcast as the office began filling with smoke and people began screaming. Uh, they were screaming, somebody's got to help us, we can't get out, this place is filling with smoke. Uh, shortly thereafter, the connection was cut off, and Cantor Fitzgerald says they've been unable to determine how many employees were actually in the offices, but those were at the top of the first tower that was hit. Um, and we all know what happened soon after. Peter? Thanks, Charlie. The woman in question was Jacqueline Cavigan, and she was looking for her husband, Donald, who was lost... Uh, uh, on the 104th store floor of the World uh, Trade Center and she called telling us among other things that she had uh, three-year-old twins and that she herself was seven months pregnant and she was simply looking for her husband because two other employees of Candy Fitzgerald uh, had been located and she was utterly convinced that her husband and these two other guys would have stuck together and Candy Fitzgerald has indeed been 
you know, one of the many focuses today. ABC's... Uh, we're being thrown. We're going to come back to a report on Cantor Fitzgerald because let's go to the Pentagon. Which I understand is... Secretary of Defense. Shortly. Um, I, I'm in route over to a, uh, another meeting in the White House in the next few minutes, so I thought I'd just stop down and make uh, two or three points. First, um, we currently believe and are certainly hopeful that the number of casualties being reported in the press is high. Uh, as you know from your own observation out there, the work is still going forward, and uh, we won't know for some time uh, precise numbers, but uh, from everything that we currently know, the the estimate that's been widely reported is uh, considerably high, and we certainly uh, pray that that's the case. Uh, second, I do want to again express our sympathy to the families and friends and colleagues of all those who have been harmed by this attack on our country. Uh, also, we're, needless to say, uh, deeply grateful to the um, many units from all over this area that are out there and have been out there for more than 24 hours. Um, firemen, ambulances, and different teams and squads of individuals who are doing a very professional uh, job for our country. Um, we are, in a sense, seeing the definition of a, of a new battlefield uh, in the world, a 20th, 21st century battlefield. And uh, it is a different kind of conflict. It is uh, something that is not unique to this century, to be sure. But it is, uh, given our geography and given our circumstance, it is... Uh, in a, in a major sense, new for this country. Finally, I'd like to say a word or two to the men and women in the defense establishment, uh, most of whom deal with classified information. Since the end of the Cold War, there's been a relaxation of tension, and uh, the it, it's had a lot of effects. It's led to proliferation, it's led to um, the gravitating movement towards asymmetrical threats as, to, as opposed to more conventional threats. One of the other effects has been, uh, it, it has had an effect on how people handle classified information. And uh, it seems to me that it's important to, to underline that when people uh, deal with intelligence information, and make it available to people who are not cleared for that classified information. The effect is to reduce the chances that the United States government has to track down and deal with the people who have uh, perpetrated the attacks on the United States and killed so many Americans. Uh, second, when classified information dealing with operations is provided to people who are not clear for that classified information. The inevitable effect is that the lives of men and women in uniform are put at risk because they are the ones who will be carrying out those prospective operations. And I, 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 this is a message really for all the men and women in the United States government who have access to classified information. It seems to me that when they see or learn of someone who is handling classified information in a way that is going to put the lives of the men and women in uniform at risk, they ought to register exactly what kind of a person that is. It's a person who's willing to violate federal criminal statutes and willing to frustrate our efforts to track down and deal with terrorists and willing to reveal information that could cause the lives of men and women in uniform. Um, I think it's time for 
all who deal with that information to treat it with the care and respect uh, that it merits. I'd be happy to respond to a few Mr. questions. Secretary? Yes, Ron. The uh, casualty figure you re referred to, I assume, is the 800 number that was provided by the Arlington County Fire Department. It is. And you say it's considerably high. We've heard from the military I said I, I hope and pray that it is. The military services, uh, t uh, information from the military services indicates that it may be more in the neighborhood of 100 to 150. Is that closer to reality, or can you give some we better guidance? We just won't know until we finish the work. The problem with trying to do roster checks with units, it may not include people that were connected with a heliport. It may not include people, contractor people. It may not include watch, watchmen. It may not it can include work people who were working in the area. Um, so, so it, 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 is, it is folly to try to pretend that there's a number before there's a number. There is not a number. N nor have we pinned down precisely how many people were in the aircraft who would also be in that general so, area. There, there are some in the Middle East who are saying that the United States does not have the belly to do the kind of response uh, to this attack on the United States. Um, that this administration, the previous administration, don't have it to go after them in the kind of way that they have to be gone after without any specifics whatsoever. Help us with the attitude uh, that you go into this process with. Well, um, I guess time will tell. Um, my, uh, I guess I'm... Uh, Kind of old-fashioned. I'm inclined to think uh, that uh, if you're going to cock it, you throw it, and uh, you don't talk about it a lot. So my instinct is that what you you do is you go about your business and do what you think you have to do. I think anyone who thinks it's easy is wrong. I think that uh, it it will require a sustained and broadly based effort, and uh, I don't think that people. Um, ought to judge outcomes until uh, a sufficient time has passed to address what is clearly a very serious problem for the world. And uh, it's not restricted to a single entity, state or non-state entity. It is, uh, it is an attack on a way of life. The purpose of terrorism is to terrorize. It is to alter behavior. It is to force people who uh, believe in freedom to be less free it, it, by altering their behavior and, and redressing a balance between freedom and security. Uh, anyone who's ever been in a war zone, as I know most of you have, you know that when you walk out of a building, you don't walk out with your head high whistling. You, you look around the corner and see what's out there. And that's not the way Americans live, and that's not the way we want to live. Secretary, Secretary, do you, Mr. Secretary, do you do, have, do, may we ask one? I was just cut off for a second, which I kindly left to my colleague. So uh, we're getting word from uh, reporters at the White House, uh, uh, quoting Ari Fleischer, that the target of the 757 was actually the White House, and also Air Force One was targeted. Uh, can you shed any uh, clarification on the that? White House. Uh, I'll leave that to the White House. Mr. Secretary, your comments on the handling of classified information, mm -hmm. is that, are you suggesting that it's time to move to a more uh, secretive uh, uh, government in which uh, there's less transparency about what it is you're doing? And how does that square with the goal of, of, of openness uh, that uh, reassures both our friends and foes around the world that mm -hmm. the United States intentions are good. We all know that there's a wealth of material that's classified unnecessarily and doesn't necessarily need to be. Well, um, I, uh, as, as I'm sure you've discovered, I do believe in openness and I think it's enormously important in a free system with a free press and, and a, a democratic underpinning to our wonderful success as a country that we, uh, we recognize that and respect it. I also know that you're quite right. There are things that get classified that ought not to be classified. But what I said is enormously important, and that is that when classified information is compromised by people who ought to know better because they're unprofessional or uncaring 
and perfectly willing to violate federal criminal law and seemingly willing to put people's lives at risk, their colleagues and their neighbors and their friends, I think it's something that should stop. So yes. Secretary, uh, sir, what's, can, what's this? Jim's question, folks, I just need to, he needs to leave. We need to get you across the room. Was, uh, was sloppy handling of classified uh, uh, information, did that play some role in, in the attacks? Um, uh, not to my knowledge. Okay, sir. It, it is an issue that I think, however, needs to be elevated and looked at and, and that people in all aspects of government What's the catalyst? What are you today? Yeah, has it happened in the aftermath? It's a little difficult here, to be perfectly honest, uh, at, least, at least from this chair, to figure out uh, precisely what the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, is saying in all this discussion about you, classified material. Just working backwards, he's just asked my report at the end whether classified information or the leaking of classified information, the availability of inf uh, classified information, played any role on these attacks in the United States yesterday, and he wasn't, he wasn't prepared to say yes to that. Uh, but he says uh, three times not altogether elliptically, um, that uh, he is distressed that, uh, that, that classified information getting out somewhere, somehow, um, is compromised because people are not caring and in some cases violate criminal law, which of course would be the case if someone was deliberately leaking classified information uh, to the press. <clears throat> He speaks uh, in favor of an open press there. But he's clearly frustrated early on about the reporting yesterday um, uh, in, in the news media about the, the degree, the extent of casualties at the Pentagon. And you'll recall that it was a local fire chief <clears throat> working on the operation, uh, working on the disaster zone at the Pentagon, who said uh, to a number of people, including to us, that he thought maybe 800 people would have perished at the Pentagon. ABC's John McCarthy has been reporting uh, repeatedly since early this morning that that number was altogether too high and believes based on his Pentagon sources that it might be closer to 200. Um, it took Mr. Rumsfeld a couple of minutes there to figure out what he meant by too high. Was it the 800 or the 200? In fact, it was the 800 figure that was disturbing him, but he will not comment on whether the casualty figures are 100, 150, or 200. But 200 is an operative figure which sources at the Pentagon have been comfortable with at this stage, while saying all the time, I think everybody we've talked to um, in every regard in New York and the Pentagon have made the point that we simply do not know at the moment because it has been under the circumstances too difficult to get at precisely um, what the casualty figures are. And this is a far, far greater problem in New York than is it the Pentagon, which if anything is a control situation, the Pentagon is more of one than it is in New York City. But Mr. Rumsfeld making a very brief, unannounced appearance on his, on his way uh, to the White House for yet another meeting. And he would make no comment on this report on the record by the President's spokesperson, Ari Fleischer, <clears throat> which among others, Congressman Chris Cox of California told us a while ago he had heard earlier was that the White House has reason to believe that the White House was the original target of at least one of the aircraft and not the Pentagon. That in itself has been... Um, has been somewhat confusing uh, to uh, to all of us, and we're working hard now that they put that out in the public arena to track that one down. We think I can now, Bob Miller, um, settle what's been going on in John. Sorry about that. That's only, all right. I think we've you. been here oh. so long, you well, I was, recognize yeah, me sooner or later. Only knowing you forever. Um, John, I think we can put Boston into greater context now. Yes, we can. Um, if, you're, if you saw that, you remember that a paper trail from a car believed to have been used by the hijackers at Logan Airport took police and the FBI to a hotel in the center of uh, the city of Boston, the Weston Hotel in Copley Plaza. Uh, as they were going to enter two rooms rented by one individual, they literally bumped into three occupants of one of those rooms leaving. Uh, those people have been taken into custody. They are not charged with any of this point. They are being detained and questioned by the FBI. Uh, but there was concern that there might be other people in the rooms. So a Boston PD SWAT team uh, did a tactical entry into the rooms, uh, found no people but found a suitcase that a bomb-sniffing dog alerted on, as well as a wastebasket. The wastebasket uh, didn't have anything in it. They could see that uh, by looking. 
but uh, an x-ray of the suitcase uh, proved suspicious. The bomb squad was able to enter it uh, wearing protective gear. They found it did not contain explosives. What it did contain, according to our sources, uh, were papers and pamphlets. Uh, there was other luggage in the room that seemed to indicate that the rooms had been used by a number of people, more than the three people who were present. And they found something that's been very intriguing to FBI investigators, according to our sources. Uh, they found hair dye products and other things that could be used to change your appearance um, if you wanted to. So the FBI has taken over that uh, crime scene now, and the investigation continues. Peter? Thanks very much, John Miller. We're going to the Attorney General of the United States, John Ashcroft. This investigation and recovery is a highly coordinated effort. I want to thank all of the federal, state, the local agencies that have worked tirelessly yesterday and today to help the victims of this act of war find relief and to help the United States of America locate the people who are responsible for these terrible acts of war. Immediately after the first report of a plane crashing into the World Trade Towers, numerous federal agencies coordinating with the White House mobilized their resources. Throughout the day, secure video conferences took place among the National Security Council, the Department of Justice, the Department of State, the Department of Defense, the Department of the Treasury, FEMA, CIA, the FAA, and other federal agencies. Both the President and the Vice President presided over a number of cabinet and sub-cabinet meetings and video conferences. Continuity of government plans were put into effect. Within the Department of Justice, our full resources were put into operation immediately. As I will explain in greater detail in a few moments, these resources have been deployed both to investigate this act of war and to assist victim survivors and victim families. But let me stress that this is not simply a Department of Justice effort. The response of the federal government across the board has been, I believe, from the President of the United States to the rescue workers, magnificent. I'll now turn to the information that the response we have been making has developed. I'll give you the information that we can give you. However, we will give you only facts that we can confirm. You may be hearing things that we have not told you, but some people have the luxury of speculating. We won't speculate, but we'll only give you confirmed facts. And also, we must be careful to protect confidential intelligence sources and the methods of our intelligence so we do not compromise this ongoing investigation or the capacity of this nation to undertake such investigations as this. The four planes were hijacked by between three and six individuals per plane using knives and box cutters and in some cases making bomb threats. Our government has credible evidence that the White House and Air Force One were targets. A number of the suspected hijackers were trained as pilots in the United States. The Department of Justice has undertaken perhaps the most massive and intensive investigation ever conducted in America. The full resources of the FBI, the Justice Department's Criminal Division, the U.S. Attorney's Offices, the INS, and other components have been brought to bear and will be focused in this endeavor. Throughout the day and into the night last night, Deputy Attorney General Larry Thompson and Assistant Attorney General Michael Chertoff, who is not with us at this moment, and I were present at the FBI's Strategic Information and Operations Center, together, of course, with the director and a number of other individuals. 
The Justice Department is working closely with investigators, the FAA, and the intelligence community, including the CIA, the NSA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the Defense Department. Numerous agencies have assigned personnel to the SIOC at the FBI to coordinate investigative efforts so that information which is received on these premises becomes immediately available to the cooperating agencies. And uh, I might add that we reciprocate with similar uh, deployments in a variety of other settings. The Justice Department's Terrorism and Violent Crime Section is coordinating the response of the U.S. Attorney's offices nationwide. These agencies have a presence at the SIOC here in the FBI 24 hours a day and are coordinating efforts both in the United States and worldwide around the clock. Investigators are reviewing intelligence and have received numerous credible leads. Command posts have been established at all crime scenes. Evidence response teams and the FBI's disaster squad have been deployed to the crash sites. The recovery of bodies and the collection of evidence is ongoing at the Pentagon and at the crash site in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. Investigators are working with the National Transportation Safety Board to recover the black boxes from the crash sites. The crime scene at the WTC has been secured, but is not yet a crime scene accessible to investigators. The United States Attorney's Office's terrorism units and the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Forces are obtaining the passenger manifests, rental car receipts, telephone logs, videotape from parking garages, and pay telephone uh, videotape records at all scenes for review and appropriate follow-up interviews. All investigative resources of the FBI's laboratory and crisis response capabilities have been mobilized. Now let me turn uh, this podium over to FBI Director Bob Mueller to talk more about the investigation itself. Mr. Mueller has just become the director of the FBI. He's brand new in every respect. I want to start by uh, saying that the men and women of the FBI join the nation in expressing our deep sympathies for the victims of these horrific tragedies uh, and their families. And we, uh, all of us in the FBI, pledge to those directly affected by these attacks, that we will leave no stone unturned in our quest to help find those responsible and to bring those individuals to justice. Forgive me. Well, <clears throat> we'll reconnect with the FBI in just a minute. And we'll get back as quickly as we can, but let's just review what Mr. Ashcroft said. He said uh, he does not want to compromise any sources, but he pretty much confirms what we have been reporting throughout the day, that three to six individuals uh, were involved city, in every one of the aircraft. Let's go back to Mr. Mueller. A flight went in. We established command posts. We have at those command posts and at a number of offices around the country where there are leads, more than 4,000 special agents who are assigned to assist this investigation. 4,000 special agents and 3,000 support personnel. We have over 400 of our laboratory personnel deployed at the crime scenes uh, in New York City, uh, south of Johnstown in Pennsylvania, and at the Pentagon. And we anticipate this level of resource commitment will, com will continue for the immediate future. In the last 24 hours, we have been addressing two objectives. The first objective is to determine, identify the hijackers on each of the plane, each of the planes. 
Having identified the hijackers on each of the planes, we then have sought to identify any of their associates remaining in the United States. Our first effort is to identify any associates in the United States who might be related to the hijackers and to remove those associates, investigate, and uh, arrest, given the evidence, those individuals, and to remove any threat to the air system in the future. That is our first objective. The second objective is to gather any and all evidence we have as to whom assisted the hijackers, and not only in this country, but also uh, overseas. We have, in the last 24 hours, taken the manifests and used those as an, evident, as an evidentiary base and have talked to many of the families of the victims and have successfully, I believe, identified many of the hijackers on each of the four flights that went down. We also have identified through a number of leads, principally at the cities of origin, a number of individuals whom we believe may have had something to do with the hijackings and we are pursuing those leads aggressively. <clears throat> Let me conclude at this juncture by emphasizing again the FBI's total and unwavering commitment to this investigation. We will not stop and as I said before we will leave no stone unturned until we have determined who was responsible for these attacks on our freedom. Now I would be happy to entertain questions as I'm sure the Attorney General would. Director, has, has there been any arrests of any of these associates that you've identified the, uh, the Now I understand that, the, that there is reporting out there that the FBI has made arrests with regard to the hijacking. That is not accurate. Uh, there have been occasions where we have interviewed individuals and come to find that the individual is out of status and that individual uh, has been uh, detained on an immigration hold. But there have been no arrests relating to these hijackings at this point. Um, talk to and people that you've identified. Are these people that have been under FBI's watch in the past relating to other kinds of terrorism activities? Are they people who you are familiar with? As we identify names, there may be one or more individuals with whom we have uh, information as to involvement with uh, individual uh, terrorist groups. Activity today in Boston, Rhode Island, and in Southern Florida. Can you walk us through in any of these cases and give us any guidance on why these particular individuals have been uh, uh, stopped and what the FBI is doing? Uh, we have uh, in Boston, uh, my understanding also in Providence, and also in uh, Miami, we have leads indicating uh, the presence at some point in time of either the hijackers themselves, and we are attempting to recreate the, the uh, travels of each of the hijackers on the planes, either the hijackers themselves or their associates. And consequently, we, were following, we are following all leads with interviews, uh, with search warrants, uh, and whatever investigative techniques are necessary to obtain the evidence. Yes. Uh, uh, still question. Still I've got, they've got to get to the White House for a meeting. How many? How many associates, Mr. Mueller, do you, do you think? And how many uh, more workers at the airport? I can't give you a definitive number on the associates. Thank you very much. Robert Mueller, the brand new director of uh, the FBI, following uh, John Ashcraft, the Attorney General. And I think these are the highlights in general, and John Miller, who's with me, will, will, will correct me. And in many cases, Mr. Ashcroft, the Attorney General, confirms some of the reporting today, and Mr. Mueller, in some cases, points out that some of the reporting is not altogether accurate. Uh, there were, as we reported before, roughly three to six individuals involved in every plane, and that knives and box cutters were used by the hijackers, the terrorists, on board to subdue or worse uh, the flight attendants and or the cockpit crews on board, uh, that they were, we've confirmed this, uh, in some cases trained as pilots in the United States. We don't know the degree of that training, but we did talk earlier to the head of a flight training school 
in Florida who believes that one of the men who is suspected as having been on board, two of the men who'd been suspected of being on board, um, had in fact taken flight training from him on small aircraft and then gone on and taken at least some measure of jet training um, at another school. And Mr. Ashcroft uh, says very flatly they have information to, they have reason to believe that the White House was a target. Now that raises a question for us here, John Miller, because he doesn't say that the White House was a target and not the Pentagon, as has been reported by Mr. Fleischer, the president's spokesperson at the White House. What he, Mr. Fleischer said, Ari Fleischer, we have reason to believe that the plane that hit the Pentagon had as its original target the White House, and they also have reason to believe that Air Force One was a target. So that has yet to be sorted out because not that Mr. Ashcroft had any conflict with Mr. Fleischer um, at the White House, but he didn't say precisely what Mr. Fleischer said. Mr. Mueller went on to say, the new director of the FBI, they've identified associates of these hijackers in the United States. They have identified individuals in a variety of locations. They've identified individuals, that's all they've said who have had a role and perhaps a passive one. I have to remember that in, in terms of the United States, some of these organizations have what are sometimes called sleepers in the United States for long periods of time um, who may be required or called into action at any given time and may not all have necessarily have arrived here in the last several days on their way to commit this terrorism. There have been no arrests, so there has some, been some reporting confusion about that. And Pierre Thomas, uh, who covers the Justice Department and the FBI for us, is with us at the moment here. Help us clarify this question of arrest. I do not believe that we have said outright that anybody was arrested. Am I right or wrong? Correct. Um, what we're talking about is a number of people have been detained. I'm told by a senior FBI official that it's fewer than 10. And these people are being held, I'm told, on immigration possible violations, also on possible state charges. None of these charges are directly connected to the attacks. But again, the sources are saying that these people are being held while the FBI attempts to find out more about them. They are described to me as associates and possible family members of some of the people that perpetrated the attack. But what Mr. Mueller actually was said that there had been no arrest, there had been interviews of people. Do you and he mean roughly the same thing? Correct. When, when I'm saying that these people are being held, in some cases they're being held as what they would call material witnesses, not on charges specific to the attack, but people who are t held on possible other violations like immigration violations and state charges. And they use those charges to hold these people while they continue to conduct background investigations of them and they try to talk to them to see if they will cooperate. Stay with me for one second, Pierre, because uh, Mr. Mueller also did say they have been following leads regarding these terrorist attacks in Florida and in Boston and in Rhode Island. And there hasn't been a lot of talk about Rhode Island. Actually, an Amtrak train heading um, towards Washington, D.C. was stopped by authorities in Providence, Rhode Island uh, today. Police went on board, um, ordered the passengers in some cases to get off and were searching them. Um, and the mayor of Providence, Rhode Island, said that actually they were looking for suspects. Pierre, uh, confirm for me, is that what Mr. Muller was talking about? Absolutely. Again, when they use the word sus suspects, you have to be careful what they're looking for as they spread out this investigative dragnet, are people that are associated with the attackers. These are people that may be, again, family members, people that spent some time with them, and they want to get information from these people about what they knew down the stretch. Okay, so let me then just pick out, as we move on out of ABC, Sam Donaldson, who is in Washington, a quote from the Secretary of State said, we don't want to say at this point that we're 40 or 50, or 60% certain that the finger should be pointed directly at Osama bin Laden, who has been given um, protection by the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. But that is certainly, Sam, the way much of the talk has been going today, both in broadcast terms and in private intelligence and political circles. Well, Peter, the working assumption is that it's Osama bin Laden and his associates are being harbored in Afghanistan. But as you point out, they're not ready to say absolutely certain. I have been talking to a source who claims to know the thinking of the president and his national security advisors as they try to work their way through this. And here's what this source tells me. First thing to do is to make